welcome to the Flat Earth Debate Uncut and After Show. I'm your host Nathan Oakley and if you are new to this channel or you've not done so already then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they premiere, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon, and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy, and this is of particular note if you drive an electric vehicle. Speaking of Patreons, I'm going to do a quick shout out to all of you who do support me on Patreon. So, a massive shout out of thanks and appreciation to Fiber Oats, Bogey, Michael Kahn, Sarah Griffiths, Rob H, Ben White, Maximum Gravy, John Kays, Tommy Swagnets, Patrick Gunnels, Banter, Will Brax, Mel B. Styles, Troy Shuker, Bose Nail, Maris, Harry Blade, Mobile Max 777, Neo the One, Lost Cat FE, Rob W, Open Minded, Reese Pound, Del West Watson, Muted, Maria Neelands, Unbelievable Productions, Blue Ridge Ranger, The Real Gabster, Liam Nedrick Jr., Abraham Mohammed, Adrian Quintana, Skeptic936, Life is Short, Texas Mike, and David Wayne Foster. So another massive thank you to all of you for supporting me on Patreon. Now I will hand over to whoever is in Discord and Google so you can enjoy their dulcet tones while I set up for today's live show. Guys so that's Sean Hall. Hold on just one second. Can you guys hear us in Discord? Yeah, loud and clear, Nathan. Good morning. Good morning. Good to have you. Sorry, Neil. What yeah, were you saying? It's been kind of quiet in here. This... I'm sorry. It's been kind of quiet <laughs> in here this morning. So... No worries. That's all good. About yeah. to get loud now. <laughs> so that guy, Sean Hawkins, you know, I hear you talking about him, but I never really heard any of those early arguments. I might have heard some of them. He really is a moron, that guy, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I jumped on Jose, Jose's chat like for like 10 minutes. That's all I could take it at, you know? I figured if I can't get them here, let me see what they got to say and I'll bring it over here. Same, same, uh, same stuff they always have, which is nothing. Didn't bring anything back then. Yeah, I got some stuff. I'll read it in a minute. What's up, Tent? Good morning. I mean, some of the stuff is laughable. It just shows they don't understand the argument of the black swan. Like saying BL BLM as B. What is the size of the earth change with the weather? <laughs> No, that's what we're saying. Yeah, that's our argument. <laughs> what? Exactly. It just shows they're not getting it. Because they say Nathan and QE say it changes with the weather. You moron. Are you, can you be that dumb? <laughs> no, we show the geometric yeah. limitation of an Earth sphere radius having changed with the weather if you assume that they assume that not us yeah everything is reciprocated thrown on us when it's their false beliefs yeah i'll give you an answer for the gas pressure without a container listen to this one this is kind of funny this is from doofus which is a great name for him manfred the pressure in our atmosphere at an arbitrary point, is proportional to the weight of the air above that point. Weight causes pressure. Easy peasy. No dome required. What's now it that is at, a moron. What's it pressing on at the top? Wow, this is a 2018 argument. What's it pressing on at the top? Yeah, yeah exactly. I told you they were going to go back to the old arguments, and they were going to go back into space. That was one of the claims. We got pictures from space. <laughs> It kind of is funny. It entertained me for a little while. But what is Rakia Life doing over there? Over where? 
Rocky Life, he's a, he's a, what do you call it, a moderator on Jose's. What, did he change positions? I don't know. I don't think so. Well, I doubt it, but maybe not. The, the, you know what is happening is people think you can change these people. So they go and give them attention and they exist because we pay attention to them. They actually have nothing to offer. They contradict themselves all the time. And that's why I don't watch anything. And then I come to the show here and everyone's talking about what they said over there and did over there. Well, if no one ever watched them, they're not going to be relevant. They're relevant because we think they're worth something. They're worth nothing. They don't come to the table with any good research or arguments. So. Yeah, you, you missed my beginning. I said I went there for 10 minutes to see what they had to say since they don't come here. Let me see what they have. Maybe I'll bring something over here for entertainment. It can only last about 10 minutes over there. And that's it. In the chat, just right. a couple of questions. They claim right. they've answered all the housekeeping questions, but they never answered any of them. I was there. They never answered one housekeeping question, right. except that's... the answer they gave just now. Right. That's why uh, this show exists to educate people on the nature of Earth properly, and their shows don't. And our audience is different than their audience. Yeah, Tenth Man, have you ever seen back in the day, maybe when you were interested in sci-fi, if you ever were, there's all kinds of apologetics within sci-fi fantasy worlds, like how would this super frigate space carrier move in 3D space, but it's all done within their fantasy world. You know, like, how does this ship yeah. turn around? You know, it's <laughs> like, okay, do we really need to set up an anti-apologetic campaign against super frigates? spinning around in vent warp space time a trillion light years from here. I'm giving it all she's got, Captain. You got it the wrong way around. It's it's them paying us attention. They only exist because we exist. They're no, anti I, 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 They're anti flat earthers, right? Yeah, that's true as well, for sure. Uh, but yeah, the the sci fi I always enjoy this entertainment. Uh, I never took it seriously. I, I, I enjoyed watching Star Trek yeah. and all that. I, I enjoyed the characters in it and the funny lines, but that's all it was. Um, I never, for one minute, thought my whole existence uh, was based on what uh, William Shatner was saying. <laughs> My wife brought that up. She's all for talking about this subject at the moment for some reason. But she brought that up about Shatner last night. And I was saying, yeah, isn't it, isn't it nuts? Basically, you've gone from um, Shatner back in the 60s and 70s doing, I can't remember what the role was, it was on Russian vids. But round about the time they were doing the moon landings, you've got Shatner in a similar role to Kirk, but it wasn't. It was like in the outer limits or something like that. And he goes up on his rocket and radio command says, what's it like from up there, Captain? And he says... It's flat. The Earth's flat. From up here, all this height up, it's flat. It's completely flat. That's what he says. So then you spin <coughs> forward to 2021, and the narrative of the mainstream, the news, that this is supposed to be reality, is claiming to actually send him up to space. So all the people who live through the fantasy idea of he represents this, the imagination of what we're doing when we go out into the reality of space that's flipped completely on his head now captain kirk is actually going to what we now know to be the imaginary area called space so in terms of his position it's not changed much right he's doing the same exact thing he was when he was going up on set and doing you know star trek he's just doing it on a different set for a different employer it just so happens that the employer <laughs> who does it for now tells the audience that what he's doing is real yeah that Sometimes a actor or actress will land a role and have sequels, and all you remember him for is that character they played in that series. Like when you think of uh, Harrison Ford, he's played many, many characters. He didn't really get stuck in Indiana Jones. I mean, he, he went on and, and did other things. Uh, 
But then there's others who that's all you remember them for. You can't remember them doing anything else, right? Like uh, Frodo in the, the the Hobbit. I mean, that's all. If I ever see that Elijah actor, I, I just think of you know the Hobbit. I don't think of anything else. I don't think so of North. Oh, okay. When I see Elijah Wood, I always think of North. <laughs> there we go. Wait a second. I was upset with Harrison Ford because they didn't do the next three Star Wars because he didn't want to be typecast. So he goes and becomes Indiana Jones. And then what do you get? You get six horrible Star Wars movies. Maybe one salvageable Return of the S- Revenge of the Sith. Some of them, they're, they're all rubbish. Well, I mean, the only one that kept it alive was you and McGregor. Come on, he he nailed um, Obi Wan Kenobi at a young age. That's the only reason why I watched it. I mean, I loved watching him act. Yeah. But the real question, Neil, is how do lasers make sounds in space? <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? Why why wouldn't they make sounds in space? You could do anything you want in Narnia. Ah, there you go. Yeah. Why no, wouldn't you that's not true. To no. hear them in no. space? You can't do anything you like uh, in Narnia. Exactly. You can't do anything <laughs> you like in Narnia. That's not true. So when you say, oh, you can just do Why? whatever you like because it's space and that's Narnia. Well, no, there's certain rules. I know we're talking about sci-fi. And in Star Wars, they've got laser beams that are travelling through a medium that wouldn't be conducive to letting you hear anything. But that's the problem that's being highlighted when you say, well, anything's possible. No, you've got to have major narrative uh, interjections to have things be possible. You can't just say anything's possible. You know, just ask yeah, Arwen. Can I give you an example? I, I just let me get to the end. Just ask Arwen. So Arwen spent the last five years trying to figure out a way of having this, well, anything's possible. If you've got a good story with a good grounding that slots into the heliocentric narrative and all the magic that's required of that story, then that story will become real. You can just conjure something. But what isn't so is that you can't just say, well, in space you can hear stuff even though you can't hear stuff, even though space isn't real, etc. Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, so they, they actually did have a huge argument within the Star Wars universe where it basically was, um, for all Star Wars, you had to do ship-on-ship fighting and laser blasters and you had to you know send small fighters in to destroy the big um, Death Star, right? And then you fast forward to the new movies, and General Haldo decides to launch her ship at light speed into the enemy fleet. And when she hits the enemy fleet, the kinetic energy, when she contacts the enemy's biggest carrier, basically just shrapnelizes all the other ships, right? And so everybody immediately noticed a logical inconsistency in the warfighting tactic because they're like, wait a minute. If you can just launch a a ship at light speed into another ship, right, the kinetic energy of a small fighter like an X-Wing, you could just launch an X-Wing at light speed because they can travel at light speed in that universe at at any of the big star Death Stars, and you just win instantly. So the whole universe is bunk. Yeah. Also, you can't have gas pressure without a container if you're to assume that it's based in any way on a narrative of reality in that regard i.e. the outer space and the spacing that the spacing the fighting that might take place in space is anyway comparable to space that we know because we don't know it it's not real but i mean you know you can you can point out that plot hole in star wars <laughs> all day long with the kamikaze x-wing that can travel at light speed to annihilate a giant starfighter and shrapnelize it and cause the rest of the fleet to be blown up yep you'd just be doing that all day long wouldn't you yeah, but let's bring a point into reality. How come people notice these inconsistencies in their entertainment, but they don't realize that they exist in the worldview presented by heliocentrism? How come they never use this to wipe out the entire Ewok tribe? I mean, it's just oh, so yeah. sense. I have a better answer. The vicious little monsters, was... they'd eat you as soon as they saw you. Sorry, go on, Eli. I have an answer because um, I was just talking about this. It's the, it's the school system. And when I say school system, let's replace that with the reward versus punishment system. What? Why? Because there's a, there's a bit of, let's replace school with the reward versus punishment system. So in this system, you have 
information that they want you to know, that they want you to retain, to go on to the next level. And whenever you use your critical thinking skills or whenever you try to use sound logic, especially when it comes to, I don't know, talking about space or Newton's laws or gravity or whatever the case, and you ask, hey, um, any, 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 any question you can think of? Well, the answer to, to you lose, using your logic is fail, right? And then that failure is not just an F on your paper, but it's also reinforced with commercials where they're like, oh, Jimmy, you don't want to be a flunky like John, do you? And then it's also enforced by, what's that word? What do you call it? What's that, what's that term? Um, well, societal pressure, let's say that. All of your friends you know, trying to get you to get along so you can advance with them. So this psychologically breaks a person down and deactivates their wants or need to utilize logical thinking skills. So when they're out of that system, your faculties are still deactivated because you've been punished for the better part of 12 years to not do that. Right. When you, yeah, so you get it. No, no, I do totally get it. No, I, I, I want my children to understand critical thought, primary, primary source research and all those things. And I did it with them today. So, well, with my eldest. Um, she's learning about Chinese New Year and about them throwing oranges with little notes attached as wishes. And I tell her all about it and read it off the story. And after she was done and she walked off and I was like, where are you going? I haven't finished. So I had to explain to her, it's like, how do you... So I, she's re answered all the questions. She's got everything correct about Chinese New Year. And I'm like, how do you know any of that's actually accurate? She's like, because you told me. I was like, well, no, but how do I know it's accurate? She's like, I don't know. I was like, well, how would you think about going about finding out if it's accurate or not? And she had to, you know, I could see the little cogs turning. She's suddenly contemplating it but can't quite wrap her head around what I mean so I had to break it down I was like okay what if I replace one of the words so I did so I just took out oranges and replaced it with crabs I'm like now because I've changed this text they don't throw oranges onto the old trees they throw crabs now is that correct she's like yeah why well because you said so is it you need to check so by the end of this process I'm going to cut this short because we're about to go live um, you know, it got to the point where she's saying, what if I went and found somebody Chinese and asked them? It's like, yeah, exactly. Find a primary source. Find somebody who's actually in China. Or, I didn't say this, but, you know, at the very least, go on to find a video of somebody actually doing it in China and then there's a reasonable chance that it's correct. Um, but just taking it as read because I've told you, I might be wrong. Hello. Hey, Owen. What's up? Debate live. I'm your host, Nathan Oakley, and if you are new to this channel, or you've not done so already, then be sure to subscribe, hit the bell notification icon and join button if you'd like to become a Nathan Oakley 1980 channel member and keep up to date with the Flat Earth Debate. If you would like to support the channel, there is a super chat that runs alongside each of these shows while they are live, and there's also a PayPal, Patreon and crypto link in the info box below the video. Also below this video, you can get £50 for swapping your UK electricity supplier to Octopus Energy. And this is of particular note if you drive an electric vehicle. 
Most importantly, if you'd like to join the discussion, simply mute the page you are currently watching, then click the link in the info box below this video to join the panel and express your views on the nature of Earth. If you do join, please don't swear. If you do, you'll be ejected. And if you are, please don't try to rejoin the stream using sock accounts. You'll be warmly welcomed back on the next stream. Please also share the show on social media. Sharing the show obviously increases the live audience, but this in turn increases the chances of a more diverse panel. So please share the show on Facebook and Twitter. Now we are joined by Neil, Arwin, Bev, Tenth Man, Eli, and a whole bunch of people on Discord. So welcome one and all. Hello. Good day. Hey. Oh, thank, hello, thanks. hello. Hello, one. Good afternoon. Hello, good afternoon. Enthusiastic lot. Any evidence that you can acquire an elevation angle from a curved adjacent? As long as it's locally flat, that works out just fine. Just fine for us, a certain Earth's a plane. Not so good if you think the Earth's curving away from you at 18 miles squared with your model afflictions. Yeah, but if you consider it to be it's locally a... flat, then just eventually <clears throat> it'll curve away from you, right? No, it's supposed to curve away at 18 inches per mile squared. Go ahead, Rams. I was just going to say, you can't even do any angular geometry with a curved line or curved lines. Precisely. That's the point of this question. Any evidence of Earth curve? Physical geometric sphere edge tangent points, formerly known as Earth curve. Yeah. Well, Zanuck did present something yesterday. He presented a triangle with three straight sides and said, this is proof of Earth curve. So I don't know about that one. Go back to this one with the angles. What angles have an adjacent? Angles have two rays and vertex. Where do you guys get an adjacent from? From your yeah. complete misunderstanding of geometry and trig? No, the adjacent is in regards to the triangle that you're going to be forming if you're measuring a star to get its GP to triangulate with it. Well, to do that, you're utilising a right-angled triangle. The adjacent is the line adjacent to the hypotenuse of the triangle with a 90-degree angle to do the trig. So, when you're measuring the angle... And you're utilising a flat baseline. That's your elevation angle measurement. You're doing that to form a 90 degree triangle with the GP of the star. So, any evidence you can have a curved adjacent when acquiring an elevation angle. That'll be used to triangulate with the stars. That's utilisation of a right angled triangle and the adjacent will be straight and flat on that right angle triangle. Are we all clear now, Neil? You clear, Sean? Oh, Sean? What do you mean, Sean? My name is not Sean. What are you doing? <laughs> that was a Sean Hawkins question, uh, question to us. May I, may I interject, Nathan? Uh, if I'd have known no. it had come from Sean Hawkins, I'd probably not answered it because it's just like, <laughs> it has to be dumbed down a little bit further. But there we go. Go ahead, Tenth. Yes. Uh, Neil and the audience listening, the minute they say 90, it's a right triangle. It's perpendicular. And that's what you subtract it from. So if they never say 90... Yeah, then you got a horizontal angle when you turn your sextant sideways and you're measuring the angle between the lighthouse and some other building or two stars in the sky. That's a horizontal measurement. But when you say in navigation, zenith, 90, subtract from 90, you're left with only a right triangle. These people are crazy. It's pretty cut and dry to me. I find it laughable. Yeah, but you're talking about somebody that's stupid. It's not going to understand the detailed explanations given daily here about triangulation. What he oh, only he pay listens. attention to is someone like Bob saying, we don't need triangles. 
he'll latch on to that bit because he's thick. He won't realise that in saying it, he got chastised and held up as an example of stupidity. That would be Bob the Science Guy when he said that you don't need a triangle. Yeah? So you, that, you just, you, you, you've sunk low, Neil. You're dealing with complete morons. Come yeah, on, so... Nathan. You don't need a triangle for triangulation. I mean, it's only <laughs> half the word. Arwin summed uh, yeah, it up. So... There you go, Neil. That was much better than my two-minute explanation. That summary was far better, Arwin. Yes, indeed. It's ludicrous. Embarrassing. I do this. I do this because they listen. They said to me, "We heard you on Nathan saying that you came here and destroyed everybody," which I never did. But I know they're listening, so hopefully, something will sink in today. Well, let's hope they're listening. Sixty people watching. Please share the show. Any evidence? The yeah, distance. Oh, so hang on, hang on. Hang oh, okay, on, okay. On. okay. Easy now. No, that same person, uh, Bob, the pseudoscience guy, said that you don't need a horizon. And then next thing you know, he says you do need a horizon. That's so. correct. <laughs> that's Laughable. what you get if you're, if you're acting as a stooge, though. So, you know, that's what stooges do. Well, Bob's a stooge. He was being a stooge for MC Toon or McToon. So same with uh, Left Lane. He was a useful idiot in that regard on yesterday's show. So I... I was up till quite late trimming that out. Um, I'll probably release it over the weekend. If you remember, you can see that right away. But um, MC Booger Eater proves a flat plane with elevation angle, I believe the title is. But yeah, sticking your head in the sand and pretending that you don't need straight lines when well, you don't have any. Why did Bob tell us that he doesn't need any straight lines? Or he doesn't need a horizon to be more accurate? Why would he do that? I'll tell you why. Because in their world, the line between you and the horizon is a bent line. Not conducive with triangulation and won't give you a triangle. So you don't need the horizon. Yeah, you do. Is the rebuttal. Crap rebuttal. But that's the rebuttal. Or don't need a triangle. Why? Well, because they can't get one off a curved surface. So they'll deny needing one. You know, it's like all of the rebuttals. Debunk their R value. We don't need R. <laughs> okay. Right, whatever you say. It's just pain for you. Hey, Sleeper Mario. Well, you don't need an R value if you know everything is a sphere. Well, that's got an R value then. <laughs> if you know it's a sphere, you've got an R value. <laughs> but that's the kind of logic they employ, yes, Arwin. But just because you know everything is a sphere doesn't mean that you can attain the radius value of everything that is a sphere. It would be fundamental to every know part it's of your... There, it, right? But it would be fundamental to every part of your existence, like they claim it is. It's, it's really tough when you have a sextant, which is an angle measuring device, to say that works on the curved surface. Really tough. Yeah, but it works because it looks so flat. Indeed. Any evidence of the distance to the sun? No, in order to get a distance, you'd need to. No, just no. Can you take the pillow no location. Uh, from between uh, your mic? Unless someone. Eli. Can you stop talking through your pillow, Eli? <laughs> oh, it's, it's a connection problem, not a mic problem. Sorry, 10th and Brian. Go ahead. I don't know who I was going to say as far as 10th, were you going ahead of me? No, I was done. Okay. Yeah, it was me. Yeah. Oh, well, Arwin, we better you go ahead. Arwin, we better let Arwin go first, Brian. Otherwise, this isn't going to go well for you. Go ahead, Arwin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In order to establish a distance, you first got to confirm a location. Is there not a step before that, though? What? Elevation angle measurement. Or that there is something actually to have tangibility, physicality to it for us to be able to do stuff with it? Yeah, the well, ground's got to be flat. Well, that's come secondary. First, yeah. you've got to establish that it has a location and that it's, you can reach that location. Yeah. You see, the, the, the issue is there with the word it. Do we have to establish that the sun is an it in the first place to establish that it's got a location? Yes. Yes. I agree. I've got evidence. Bear with me. Oh, really? Claims that that claims that the sun is a physicality and it therefore has a distance and we can we can calculate it, we can measure it. Hold on, I heard two things in that statement. I have evidence that there is a claim. Was that what you said? 
No, I have evidence that claims that the sun is a physicality for us to be able to measure its distance to. Yeah, that's what I thought he said. So yeah. there's evidence that somebody's claiming this. Yeah. <laughs> that's, no, that's no. What... I have empirical evidence that a claim is being made. No, 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 no. I have evidence that claims to have proved the, 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 that the sun is a physicality. Okay, that's okay. To, no, that, no, you've rephrased light. it. Okay, what is this claim to be evidence of sun physicality? Blasphemer. Okay, so can you see my screen, Nathan? Present can, it if yeah, you would. Yeah, audience has got it. 5th of February, 1960. All right. Radar echoes from the sun. This is a bit like the ping reflections from Venus, but now this is directly to do with the sun. And it says, on a number of mornings in September 58, April 59, and September 59, attempts were made at Stanford University to obtain radar echoes from the sun. So it's direct parallels to the Venus one. And we've already established the Venus one was based on the assumptions like the, of Eratosthenes, right? The data obtained on three days in April have been intensively analyzed with the aid of digital electronic computer. It appears that the solar echoes were obtained on each of these days, the experiment was possible only because of the availability of facilities built up at Stanford for several different research programs. It goes on to talk about lots of things to do with um, the history of it, but I want to point out this bit here. It says, quote, The time travel of a radar pulse to the sun, approximately 93 million miles away, and back to the Earth is about a 1,000 seconds. At the end of the transmitting period of 900 seconds, the antenna was connected directly to the receiving system, and the transmitter and pulsing circuits were turned off. So what it's saying is, after 900 seconds, they stopped pinging data or pinging um, stuff to and from the sun, and then they connected it to the receiver. The issue that is the problem here is that they're assuming that they know how far away the sun is to be, to get something back from it, but they spent 900 seconds pinging um, data like against what they think is the sun. And now they're going to start reading it. Is it possible that they might be re like receiving reflections of of these ping datas from, say, a covering over the top of it that's bouncing around like radio waves, continuously no. bouncing? Maybe. It, well, that, that's but, a possibility. But whatever. Uh, uh, hold on. I, I'm not going to get into you immediately putting this onto your own burden of proof reversal, where you have to suddenly justify something you're claiming it might be. Let's not do that. Let's stick to what you've but said. The sleeping claim is. warrior. Ah. He always does. Ugh. Yeah, I know, he's interjected with his own postulations that weren't necessary. But thank you for the claim. Okay, you've already pointed out the first problem. Brilliant. So they haven't got an hour to get the timing to claim they've got a received signal within the heliocentric framework based on R. Same problem Christian Hugens has got. He solved it by just giving you an R by assuming that, was it Venus is the same size? No. Yeah, Venus is the same size as Earth. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, Again, he I assume that Venus was the same size as Earth, right. and he assumed that Eratosthenes calculated the circumference of Earth correctly when he assumed that it were a sphere. Right, so this has got the same thing, but it's already got that R measurement to say we've already got the timings. So we already know how yeah. long it's going to take to come back. And then they send out a constant stream, and then they turn on the receiver and go, there you go, it's, it's just come back. And that's obviously the first one we sent out, going on the timings that we know with R, which has been debunked. Right, there's a second problem, though. Does he mention anything about black bodies in that text? Black bodies? Yeah. No, Sun I'm in not the about black bodies. claimed to be a black body. How are you supposed to get a return signal from it? I don't know. You can't. I'm only telling you what it says, but well, you can't. let me read this it's, little it's, bit. It's a, a plot hole this in the Star This is 70 years ago. <laughs> oh, God, Darwin, third time you've interrupted this conversation. It's part of their narrative that the sun is a black body. So in their narrative, they can't get a return signal from it. Now, I don't care what the sun is, and I'm not going to try and postulate why they're getting a signal back from their little man-made devices that they're claiming with heliocentric timing that we've debunked by taking out their R value they don't have anymore and pointing out when they've done this in the past, they had to make massive heliocentric assumptions about things in the sky and transposing that R value onto them to give them this timing that they've already got in place to turn off the machine and turn on the receiver. None of it's relevant. They don't have R. Further to that, in their own bloody model, they've got the sun described as a black body. So they're not going to get any reflecting signals off it. It's such complete nonsense and doesn't even work in their own narrative. Don't they say that it's not a perfect black body and therefore they can it's get It's not. That's married bachelor style. You can't have a non, not quite perfect black body. No, it's either is or isn't situation. Well, let me just continue reading this a little bit because this is uh, I think this is really useful. It says, Trials were scheduled for each morning from the 5th to the 13th of April inclusive. 
because of various difficulties, for example, equipment failures, timing ambiguity, that's a big issue, isn't it? Timing ambiguity and radio interference. Recordings suitable for intensive analysis were obtained only on the 7, 10 and 12 of April. The test procedure for September 58 differed in several respects from that described above. They've done it a few other times since, but the key point is that they didn't get reliable information at all for several days. And how difficult would it be to get reliable ping data if you, I mean, the sun's massive in the sky compared to Venus. How hard can it be? Is that a much bigger problem? Uh, did yeah, I want watch my video Brian. again? Brian, Brian's been waiting for okay. ages, actually. I forgot to reintroduce him, Marwin. But yeah, if you can wait until after Brian, that'd be great. Okay. Uh, do you want me to wait for Arwen? We've done that gag once. I'm sure he'll actually okay. be tolerant. Okay. Uh, yeah, has anyone actually watched my video at the weekend? I've watched lots of your videos. Which one specifically? The, one I, the last one I brought out two at the weekend, one is connected to the other. But the last one I brought out was about the parallel sun rays. None of this works without the one-way speed of light measurement. So all this stuff means nothing. Because you have to have... They're, they're using a two-way speed of light calculation that's based on two averages, one of them being an R value average, and four pre-assumptions not real so none of it can work perfect that's the third that's problem they, well, they haven't got a speed of light for their timings yeah go ahead Arwin right so yeah the first thing that stood out of me immediately within the first 30 seconds that Tony started reading on it, on it is what they've basically done is assembled a bunch of computers pre-assumed an entire setup and then calculated it Yep. So they didn't do anything. They just calculated. They sent a bunch of signals and then pre-assumed it, then eventually divined the results with, what is it, three out of uh, who knows how many. So they got like 10% actual results that they could get to fit within the model that they were expecting. So they were just divining data based on presuppositional models using computers. Also, it's 70 years ago. They didn't know it was supposed to have a black body yet. It wasn't, it wasn't ideally described that way yet. It wasn't absorbing all ra magnetic radiation or whatever black body does at that point. So, you know, they didn't know. It's a bit like, you know, their narrative with traveling through high radiation belts when they go to the moon. Well, they didn't know about them then. So it didn't pose any problem. Now it's part of the right, is it, But isn't that well, the magic no, trick, listen, though? Can I, it's a good comparison to say Star Wars, the, 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 the movies that came after, right? Uh, in the 80s, they didn't know... <laughs> they didn't know that Han Solo was going to get a kid, right? But he's there, and his very important role, apparently, in the movie story continuation. And now we're there, so we know now. Well, exactly. anything that was going to be done back then, they didn't know that was going to be it. And likewise, as the example we got earlier from whoever it was, I've forgotten, <laughs> we had an example where, you know, in the more recent Star Wars, which are technically in the further past in their chronology, you've got them sending warp drive, or whatever they call the speed of light in um, Star Wars, X-wings, little ships, to destroy gigantic great big motherships. And uh, as a result, all the shrapnel destroys all the rest of the fleet. And you're like, but they didn't know that in the 80s, which is technically in the future, in that storyline. <laughs> it's like they didn't know in their future that their past involved uh, somebody just sending something through warp drive and destroying everything. <laughs> so, Hold yeah. on. Hold right. on. The whole, oh, the whole yeah, yeah. Star Wars the, set the takes one. place in the past. Yeah, y using, uh, what is it, warp drive... Uh, suicide ramming tactics yeah that because if they'd known <laughs> they would have done that a lot hyperspeed i think it's called is it hyperspeed in light speed no light oh, warp drive warp they, drive no, technic, no that's no, warp drive that's star, star trek. trek no jump to light speed that's yeah, there you go there you go obviously important we store out this nonsense because it's closely related in fact the exact same as the heliocentric stuff we brace against we should really spend more time talking about some of that. I know in the past we've yep. focused on stuff like Matrix, but ultimately speaking, a lot of the programming is reinforced 
I'm not going to say daily because not everyone's watching movies daily, but almost daily by the media we take in. You know, heliocentrism is part of our stories. And it's like when they tell you age, ages gone by, where people would sit down and reiterate the stories of the religion of the time to make sure that the descendants would pass them on to their grandkids and so on. Well, we've got the same thing now with our religion. We just have the stories of heliocentrism told in the format of Star Wars and Star Trek and Red Dwarf to reinforce the religion of the time. Yeah, can I, can I make yeah, a quick comment? I just want to brought that up. Citation um, police, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So in a fictional world, okay, where everyone knows it's fiction, when you do a, a continuity error like that, it's called retconning which is short for retroactive continuity. So in a fictional world, you can make up stories of what happened in the past because there actually is no tangible past. But in reality, that's called an ex post hoc fallacy, where you're taking something from the future and imputing it on the precedent. Post ad yes. hoc fallacy. Can I, can I, I love it. You're good with these um, citation police. You're right on the money with all your fallacies. So... Um... I can't remember an example to give, but there's been several when I've been editing the videos going, right, he's, he's in there trying to get a word in and he's blighting out the fallacy. John does it as well, but John does it in text form. So his te he knows that his text messages that he's sending in the live stream G plus chat will flash up. And both you and he identified a particular fallacy at exactly the same time. I think it was with Flat Earth Goddess. It'll come to me. We still haven't done housekeeping, by the way. Any scientific evidence of gravity? Uh, I still wanted to round out that good subject because I love the conversation. What, Star I'll keep Wars. it short. Star Wars and Star Trek. No, not and... Star Wars. Storytelling in general. Because okay, go ahead. What, no, go uh, ahead. The, 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 the guy that, who just talked and gave that quote, right? I use that all the time as a game master. So what I used to do is I get the players in, I draw, draw up some quickly improvised idea of the scenario... Let the players do what they do. Sometimes the players, as they play, they come up with what might this be? They see this grandiose thing in something that I basically improvised. Then afterward, not having hinted to them like, oh, I just made this up. I don't say that as a game master. But then afterward, I use what they thought it was going to turn out to be to actually build a backdrop story for what really happened afterward. And it works brilliantly. Yeah, in this example, though, we've got an introdu an introduction of an error that doesn't comport with the rest of the narrative, but the error's been introduced after the fact. So post-ad hoc, well, ad hoc would be on-the-spot explanation for something that doesn't work. Post-ad hoc, well, I don't need to explain that any further, but that's brilliant, uh, Citation Police, I love it. So Category error completely... fallacy, category error, I think it was, the other day. Maybe it wasn't. So can I just uh, conclude my point? My point now is that we've now established that the sun is a physical body. That's the claim of the document because it got successful ping bounces back from it. So that's the proof that it is physical. So we can measure it. No, they don't have our... No, they can't derive the mathematics. They assumed the timing. They haven't got a two-way speed of light. And what was the last one? The, the, it's the a black body. Claims. Black body. The article proves that they, they did get ping reflections from it. So it is a physical body, Nathan. You're just denying the science. Uh, yeah, well, no, yeah, we just no. applied a little bit of critical thought to it. <laughs> Science doesn't prove things anymore, remember? <laughs> yeah, but 99% of the Western world is going to lock on to that as proof. Yep, they're just a bunch of Smurfs now. This is from the 60s, Neil. Does that matter? It's, well, it is actually being cited by Blurfs. Smurfs. They're called Smurfs now. No, they're called Blurfs. All oh, right. Can't well, then, that's an expression of endearment. If it's currently being cited by Blurfs, that would be anti flat yeah. earthers. I would have it in the lexicon down as, but Blurfs is good enough. Well, then that's cause for pain when we rip it to shreds, as we've just done, right? Anybody want to poke at the Blurfs, bears that just... are now bleeding? A Blurf is basically a bloated Smurf. Yeah, lovely. Let's not ruin the term Blurf. It's a good term. Next, next I'm question. I'm not ruining it. I'm introducing a whole new way of thinking to grasp how science has become a culture by displacing the word and 
instead using Smurf. And then you can suddenly Smurf everything. And that's how the Smurfs call everything Smurf, right? That's how science has been used and mutilated and turned into a cultural word. You mean I'm like gonna... we used to, we used to have all this Smurf for the globe and now Smurf doesn't prove anything? <laughs> exactly. Smurf proves yeah, absolutely gets it. Smurf chocolate. <laughs> Smurf <laughs> proves Smurf. Yes, yeah. that's the level we go yep. to. Smurf more. <laughs> I just want to give credit to where I got this information from. I want to shout out to the um, the, the website that is mctoon.net because that's where he cited it from for proof that the Earth is uh, the Sun is a physicality. So now you, everybody in the audience, is aware that it came from McToons. He's made a claim that it's proof that it's physical and it, and we can measure it therefore, and that's where you'll find it. So, so shout out to McToon. It, it, he he cited his own website. <laughs> well, that's where I cited it from. So he's citing that the thing that proves it's a physical body is this this, this black body reflects things. That's uh, the well, yeah, but he says that it's he said what he, I've, I found on, I went on his website to see what he says with respect to the uh, the black body claim, and he says uh, let me read to you. He says um, it's really good. He says oh where's it gone? It's here. He says some people have claimed that the sun is a black body, therefore cannot bounce radar. This is incorrect. The discussion on the sun's black body status quotes, there is no such thing as a black body. The concept of a black body is an idealized an idealization based on some simplifying assumptions. The sun doesn't exactly sac- satisfy those simplifying assumptions. And then he gives a link. And I guess where he links it to? Quora. So it's people chatting in Quora, and that's his citation to debunk the claim that it's oh. a black body. That's, that's Wait, it's their claim. Evidence, hold on. Oh, hold on. This is back to them fighting amongst themselves then. Uh, it's yeah. their claim. Correct. There's all things to work out. Okay. So to rephrase McToon's website, part of our claim is the assertion that the sun is a black body. Wrong. Doesn't work that way. Here's some people on Cora discussing how it doesn't work that way. Yeah. No science for whether it's a black body or not. Just people on Quora discussing it. No, you missed my point. Hold on, hold on. You missed my point. Sorry. Are we claiming it's a black body, Anthony? Well, that's what he's, he's citing a rebuttal to, that we claim that it's not a black... That yeah, we yeah. claim that it is yeah, a black yeah, body. Yeah, I got that. Listen again. Are we... Uh, do you go around claiming the sun is a black body, Anthony? No, 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 no. Do I go around claiming the sun is a black body? Or did I specifically no, no, reference no, no, no. it with, in their narrative, they claim it's a black body? They being globe believers with their narrative of the sun and what it is. Not us. Correct. So when he says some people, he means ball believers who are on his side assert that it's a black body, but he doesn't agree with the ball believers who claim it's a black body from his own side. That's what he actually means, because we don't claim that. And yep. should he claim that we you do claim your... that, we'd point out where they claim it and then say, regardless, you haven't got an hour value to get your timings. You and your black bodies are ruined, Nathan. <laughs> Tony. <laughs> I was waiting for that. You can kill it at the source before you go to the sun. Go on. What's the source? They use spectroscopy, right? They no do, radar they, bounces in this case. They do, but in this, it yeah. Well, oh, this is a radar bounce you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah, even a radar bounce. Is only... Sorry. Hold on, Alvin. Even a radar bounce, there's stuff in between us and the sun, right? So they negate yeah. that. Oh, there's hold clouds. On. There's. Oh, hold on, yeah. hold on. You gotta be so but careful. Now you're arguing with Hold on. Enough. No. If you don't do what I've done, you're going to get jumped on by me. I'm sorry, SE Montreal. Right? So you're now claiming that stuff between us and the sun, are you? That's your claim now, No, is it? I'm claiming their, their fantasy. Uh, their you've got to be careful world. what you say. You just made it as a claim. That was the oh, word you used. On that. The second he said it, yeah, it was... You've made a claim the second you go there. You've got to stay away from our claim, whether there is or there isn't. In their world... Whilst it's still claimed to be a vacuum, there is still matter. I think they just conjured dark matter. Arwin, into right, the... Arwin, I don't know what's into you today. 
all the important Sorry. points are getting rumpus by you. Just try once more, Adam. <laughs> we'll get there, I promise. <laughs> Sorry to single you out and take our time over this SE Montreal, but it's just a bugbear that leads people into a trap where they end up having to defend stuff they've said. And they're like, no, what I actually meant was you claim it. And they turn around if it was MC Toon in this example with black bodies. I don't claim it. Because it's about him and his... Cl no, it's about heliocentrism and their overriding claims that they make about their stuff. Agreed, yeah. Well, uh, to be honest, I thought you were talking about spectroscopy, so my my, my bad. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll concede on this one. Uh, no, SA has a point because they actually use radar in celestial spectroscopy <laughs> and satellites. So SA actually has a point. <laughs> Well, look, that we can we can further this because what is radar? It's supposed to be light, right? A it's not spectroscopy. No, it's <laughs> not spectroscopy. That, that it is <laughs> sorry, not. Go on, Absolutely. Sorry. sorry, ask a question, Essie. Sorry. No, no, I'm just I'm just making a point that what well, you guys said it's black body radiation, and obviously that's what they claim. So it cannot bounce off the sun. Absolutely, like there's no there's no disputing that. But my point is, what's between us and the sun? That's the point I was making. They they kind of like brush that aside, right? Like open whatever, open space. And I'm saying <laughs> that's not the case in their fantasy. Right. Well, okay. we're at the point their language for them, though, because they'll, they'll make it your argument rather than their own. That's what Nathan was saying. Yeah. That, but what, what they maybe I can do. repeat my point again. Well, I was going to say, I would go ahead. Yeah, because everybody else seems to be able to do that without getting criticism for it. Oh, right? it's going to turn into just... a moan. It's not going to turn oh. into yeah, a valid yeah, point. Yeah, 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 because it's like the fourth time now, the fourth time. Yeah, just make a smurfing point. This I'm whole not making a smurfing point. I, oh, I was making a singular feedback. quick sentence to clarify everything, but it seems to be so wrongly timed that I have to be criticized for it every time, right? So what I wanted to say, again, is this whole black body of the sun is just heliocentrist fantasists injecting dark matter into the sun, right? Another mathematical correction to account for things that aren't actually real. No. That's what it is. I'll tell no, you another not, killer no, on this. Not dark matter, no. no. It isn't literally dark matter, but it's the same effect as dark matter. It's there to account for something that isn't actually there. Oh, by comparison. No, fair enough. Yeah. Just just ad ad hoc, point. yeah. Ad hoc. Correct. What the hell is dark matter? Oh, they just I'll give you up. a better one for this fantasy killer. <laughs> like, go on, How long do they say that the light takes to travel from the sun to us? Uh, Brian. A thousand seconds. I think uh, uh, hold eight, on, sleep more. 8.03 minutes. 8.03 light minutes. Correct. So what are you pointing your radar at? You're pointing at you know, what? They pointed at the You're sun. Pointing I think. at what? They say they pointed at the sun. I don't know what they. I presume yeah, that. Yeah, but the sun ain't there. <laughs> well, that's another thing. You like, add, 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 yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's a but valid they, point. They the sun's not where they say it is on their model, is it? You can't point it at the sun because it's like nine minutes moved around the orbit, the rotation of the Earth, because the time it's take for the light yeah. to get here. You're going to move. Exactly. Uh, Obviously, adjust for the movement to... like you're We're hitting gonna... a running target. Wait but a minute. There's it's... like three people. That was a good point. Yeah. Go they ahead, don't Adam. have. Yeah, the sun's always in its apparent position, right? Hey. Hold on, everybody. <laughs> just hold on. Everyone. Uh, uh, that was a good guys, point. I just wanted guys, to get through. Hold on. Oh, God. There's 11. Hello. Vectors. Can you hear me trying to get control? Adam, go ahead. Yeah, well, just to follow on from what you're just saying, that's that's one thing. You've got to aim to an imaginary position where you think the sun is going to be in eight minutes when you fire your uh, ray out. And then you've also then got to calculate the angle that you're going to bounce this thing off a spherical surface so that you can catch the rebound ray when you've moved yeah. in the heliocentric model for 16 minutes. Um, because it's got to go there and then come back to you. Assuming it will be 16 minutes because you're going to have to work out the trajectory. There may be slightly differences in in the length of the triangle you're building. Um, but ex it suddenly becomes exceptionally complicated because, like I said, you've then got to account for 
rebound off of a spherical surface. Yeah, right. and also yeah, so yeah, they could just get that. some old lady to do the math for them. Yeah, right, and not only that, look at this. One second, it's, it's all bit wild. Brian's waiting to back, get his right? point in as well. Then Sleeping Warrior. Brian, then Sleeping Warrior, then Citation, please, if you would. Thank you, Nathan. Yeah, all this falls apart because there isn't a one way speed of light measurement. Or everything to do with this and everything to do with parallel light rays, all that rubbish. There's no one way speed of light measurement. So all that is complete and utter rubbish. How would you find the Hold on. angle just of the second, radar? John. Just one second. Go ahead, sleep more here. I was just adding on to what Adam was saying about how complicated it gets because obviously the Earth has moved in its orbit, so no longer is the sun in the position it appeared to be on in the or relative to our horizon because of the Earth's rotation. It's also moved in its orbital position, so it's no longer in the position it was at when it was send, sending its signal exactly. originally. How did they get the freaking yeah. return signal? Just, just one sec. Yeah, uh, hold on, hold on. It's worse than that. Go ahead. Citation, please. Okay. You guys are only talking about the relativity between the two bodies. But remember, in the heliocentric model, there's 11 displacements. 11. Right. Okay. You, okay. The, you shout out to you. the galactic displacement, the cosmic displacement, and there's all these other vectors going on that they didn't account for whatsoever. Yeah, it's a whirling dervish wall. It's a, something that you... That's just you, details. Something that YouTube tries to draw attention to. Back in the day, three or four years ago, he used to moan at me. You don't talk about this enough. <laughs> from the chat. Shout out to YouTube. There was someone else from the panel who wanted to get a word in, in that. Who was it? It was me. Sorry, um, John. I was going to say, how do, you, how do you account for the angle that you're going to fire this radar at the sun? You're going to need a flat plane for that. Yeah. We'll just guess. Isn't the sun just like the Earth locally flat too? It's even supposed to be a much bigger ball, so. <laughs> what? <laughs> Disco ball sun? How we just said, isn't the sun supposed to be locally flat too? It's also just a big ball, therefore also flat. Just are we throwing in contradictions in terms just to throw us all off our game? <laughs> that's, that's so annoying. Because why not? It's the whole model. It's what it is, a whole contradiction in itself. It's ridiculous. But they do actually claim locally flat. I mean, Arwen's, while it sounds absurd, that is actually what they claim currently. When they're drawing out tangent planes to geometric horizons they don't have, what they're drawing is a flat plane teeter-tottering on a single point of a sphere that's no longer being used. The imaginary floating flat plane <laughs> that's got nothing to do with the sphere below, other than one point, the tangent point horizon that we've debunked. That's the only connection it has to the sphere, the tangent point, and we've debunked it. Sad times for Globers at the moment. It really is. The circle of equal hey, <clears throat> altitude destroyed locally flat. Nathan, you brought up an excellent point. Remember, oftentimes we'll point out that they're projecting the problems in their model. So they accuse us of having this imaginary floating infinite flat plane in free space, but really they're the ones who have that. Yeah, that's another one like the edge <laughs> when they ask us to give them an ice wall. Or to show us the dome when we tell them they can't have gas pressure without a container. Here they are doing it again. You've just got a floating plane in space that bears no relation to anything we experience. No, we don't. You think you're on a sphere and you've got a fl floating plane in space that's got no relation to anything spherey. Other than the tangent point <laughs> we debunked. Well, if the Earth is a ball but locally flat, then maybe all balls actually turn out to be locally flat. I think that geodesics really agree with that concept. No ball is flat anywhere. It's one of the intrinsic geometric properties of a sphere shape. No flat anywhere at all, ever, at any scale. That's correct. Don't but tell Highland though that. He might laugh at you. He, he wanted to argue. No, I'm allowed to argue with you that my ball's got lots of flat surfaces on it because he wanted to argue that. You know, on the one hand, we have them telling us no flat ever. If it's completely flat, as you walk along it, you're local to gravity and it is definitely curving eight inches per mile squared. Ergo, they say the salt flats are curved. They're, they're curved flats. That's what they say. Because there isn't, there's no tolerate, tolerance of non-curved surfaces on a sphere. Because that's what a sphere is, right? So you end up with bendy zontal. 
Well, then when you point out that, well, no, you're going to have to have flat surfaces to do this trick, they go, well, obviously I can argue for having flat surfaces all over this sphere now. But no, you can't. That's what you brace Absolutely. against when you claim it's a sphere. Yeah, but yeah, they've we been forced out, to concede uh, we pointed that... this out the other day. Just one sec, citation, please. Go ahead. Um, uh, oh, thanks. Yeah, just wanted to say, like, no, look, if the ball they're standing on it actually is flat, but it's also a ball, then, well, that applies to everything else in in their model, then, including a contradiction. the other balls. Yeah, so they're just... all actually flat, right? Mathematically, at least, even though they're all balls. And if it's okay contradiction. with contradiction. Your... Okay, with everything else. Yes, that's right. But Arwen's pointing out the farcical nature of that contradiction while you're chanting his point through him out there, Neil. But yes, it is a contradiction. Sorry. That's the point Arwen's making and labouring it with an example of how contradictory it is. They want it to all be flat on a sphere. It but, makes no sense. Well, why do they want oh, it to all be flat? Why do they have to correct it to flat when they're making these measurements? Because it is. That's why. Yep. Yeah. You oh, would wait. think that would okay. wake them Just up. Just one a sec, bit. Neil. Go ahead, citation, please. Okay, so when Highlander made that claim, he didn't realize the implications that if you force a horizontal plane onto a sphere, it would not be experienced from the point of observation as a plane that's horizontal. It would be experienced as a slope. Yeah. But when oh, you're trying you're to gain center of the horizontal plane if you were in the center of the plane it wouldn't be horizontal to you it would look like two reciprocal slopes that's correct that's why they don't mention 90 so if you have it oh somebody happens to have a handy diagram i oh, know it's not quite what i was hoping for nevertheless um it, it is okay do you take it away brian it's this is you're better at depicting these things than describing them mine so go ahead you're on screen yeah, just showing the difference between reality and what the globe claims. So in reality, let's say this is where the observer is. This star is at their 90. This star is going to be at their 70. You're talking 60, you know, uh, 45, 35, you know, something like that. So due to perspective, the stars will appear to drop uh, in the sky, but that's why the angle is changing to them. They're moving away from you, just like uh, looking along a long a straight road with lamps along the road. The uh, the lamps appear to drop down. If the road is long enough, it'll end up with just a light uh, on the horizon. That's what will happen. <clears throat> um, and so that's that's reality. So all their angles come from reality, you know, because they have to. But what they do then is they do this, right? What they did then was they started using reality and call them tangent planes. These little purple ones were ta are tangent planes. They are claiming that the likes of Polaris is huge and very far away. So everybody, so all these angles are all basically parallel to each other, all these lines here of sight of Polaris on their model are all parallel to each other. But they have all these tangent planes that they need for all these angles. So what they did then is, how they did it, how they back engineered it is, they just took reality, brought it to the center of their globe across their equator, let's just say, and determined uh, due to distance. So they knew as they moved away from Polaris, let's say, this way is the flat way. If they move away from Polaris, it starts to drop in the sky, appear to drop in the sky as they moved away, right? So they worked it out that if you bring that to the center of, of, a, of a circle, that that appearance of drop, if you ignore perspective, that appearance of drop can be worked out as a degree change from the center of a circle. And they worked out with the distance in accordance with the drop, what what that degree change would be in accordance with the distance. So let's just say I'm going to go right around this circle here, around to this uh, point here. So from the north star here around to their equator, that is uh, 5,400 nautical miles. So they worked it out that this line here is about, they worked it out due to the amount of drop per distance 
of Polaris, right? Optical drop. They worked it out that, well, that is about X amount of nautical miles, and this one's here is about X amount of nautical miles, and this one here is about X amount of nautical miles, and this one's here is about X amount of nautical miles, because all that is, the longitude lines, is straight line distances. They're just horizontal distances, and that's what Eratosthenes measured, a, a part of a straight line. Uh, he, doesn't, he didn't use nautical miles at the time, but that's what he measured, a portion of a, a longitude line. A portion of a flat diameter, that's what he measured. And that's why him and Al Biruni had to refer to the maths of Pythagoras. What is Pythagoras famous for? Right angles. The Pythagorean right angles, that's what he's known for. So all he did was took the right angle, put it in the center of a circle, then worked out what the radius would have to be of that circle for them to match what they see in the sky. So all these angles from the center all match up with their parallel uh, lines of sight to Polaris, but they had to create all these tangent planes, all these reality planes for it to happen. Because really all, was there, all they were doing was exactly what we see here on the left. They're all just, uh, uh, as they moved away from Polaris or as the nearest star moved away, they, they appear to drop in the distance. Let's ignore perspective. Let's put that 90 degree angle in the center of a circle and they worked out what the radius of that circle would be. Um, so that's and claimed that the sky was curved because look curved because we are on a curved surface as opposed to we are on a flat surface and the sky only appears curved, but it's not really. It's actually, from what we can tell, flat. Okay, if so we to, use angles. to follow on from Citation Police's example, if you can keep this on, on screen, Brian, what Citation Police is saying is from this position. Let's say that your star in the centre is actually your viewing position. Now, we're going to do this off a spherical surface. Now, when you've got a tangent plane from this point to, let's say, the last star in each example, yeah? So, on each point on the right, you've got your, your straight line coming down, which is where this doesn't work, because this needs to be 90 degrees to the position that you're measuring from. So, in terms of the line of sight to this star, they describe, well, we do have a flat surface, but it's a flat surface meeting the surface of the sphere at a tangent point. Now that only works if you first measure the angle to the star off a flat baseline. That would be a tangent, they have teeter tottering on the top of this sphere. The problem then occurs when you measure the next star, because that star and its GP is tangent to the plane in a completely different slope to where you've just measured. Now, if you do measure it on a flat plane, which you must, to get the angle, the elevation angle proves Earth is flat. Then take that measurement and do what Brian's discussed, which is put the measurement that you took on the surface in the centre of the sphere. Then you can match it up to the measurement you took on the surface. But you have to first have everything, every single star, meeting at 90 degrees to a plane from your position. So it means that each and every angle you take is taken off a flat plane to then move the maths to the centre of the presupposed spherical Earth to make it work with the presupposed spherical Earth. The problem being, you're not standing in the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth when you measure a line with a flat plane beneath you. You're on a plane measuring an angle. So that's where you've got to begin to get the angle, to make the assertion that every single line isn't coming in uh, in the way we see it, diverging light. It's all coming in parallel and to the centre of a presupposed spherical Earth. You've got to make that assumption after you take an angle measurement on a plane. I'm just going to show Nathan, right, just to back up exactly what you said. I'm going to take away the circle. The zenith, right, I'll bring this up a second. Zenith always has to be above the head of the observer and always has to be above the GP of a star, the, the, the geographical position of a star or whatever. Meeting the ground at 90 degrees. Yeah, exactly. So, so they can never talk about the centre because zenith, and this is the def official definition from astronomy, has to be above the head of the observer and above the, the geographical position of the star. So the problem there is that that means they have to be above the surface. 
So if on a globe, they have to be above the surface. They can't be just above the center. They have to be above the surface to be a zenith. And when they do, when you do, I'm going to take just a, a different line in a sec, and I'm going to make it a different color. I'll make it something bright like red, uh, red. So what's wrong then is that if I take a zenith angle from, there's my 90, right? There's my zenith, and I take a zenith, I take a, a zenith distance, to this star, right? And let's say that is, let's say that's, I don't know, 45 degrees or 50 degrees above the horizon, whichever, right? Then that other, that star, there's the GP of that star. So this is the zenith above the GP. This is the zenith above me. And this is the measurement, right? It's the zenith distance between the co-altitude. So let's say that's, let's say that's 50 degrees. That means I have to take that from 90. And that means 40 degrees by 60 nautical miles. So 40 by 60 nautical miles is 40 by 60. Uh, that's 40, uh, sorry, sorry. That's uh, 40 degrees. That's uh, 60. Uh, 40 from 90, uh, sorry, is 50, right? So that's 50 minutes of degree, which become 50 by uh, uh, 50 times uh, 60 nautical miles. So that, the only way to have that is for a 90 degree angle, right, at your zenith, and another 90 degree angle at the, ge the uh, geographical position of the star. And that, that distance along the top here is translated straight down and becomes your horizontal distance along the surface of Earth. So four sixes are what? Six and six is 12, four sixes are 24. It'd be 2,000, is it 2,400? What is the distance? It'd be 40 by, uh, um, sorry, it'd be uh, 50 by, sorry, 50 by 60 uh, nautical miles. That would be your distance along the, a hor the horizontal, around a horizontal plane. Because you have to use, you can't use 90 degrees without a right angle. It's can't just, get uh, 90 so degrees <laughs> unless the line along the base to any position below any star that you can see and measure is flat. This is proof that we live on a plane. So just had a super chat from Mike. He says, what happened to talking about proof? This is proof, Mike. Thank you very much for the super chat, by the way. Nathan, I'd like to share a slide, uh, if, but I need Brian's, uh, I'm, I'm gonna kick Brian off if I share it, so. You done, you done, Brian? Brian? If, if so, thank you very much, that was epic. No hassles. I, I just wanna show just before we go, this here, that is a co-altitude, the zenith distance from zenith to zenith. That is, let's just say that's, uh, let's say that's a, this is a 40 degree angle, that will be 50 uh, minutes of degree. Okay, that will be then a... trans transformed into 50 times 60 nautical miles as another straight line measurement <laughs> on the surface of Earth. Okay, uh, I'll go off there. Okay. No, that's minusing from 90, when you say you're going to minus it from 90, but th that leaves one question before I let 10th go. Um, okay. w when you acquire zenith, so if you're measuring it from your zenith, how do you get your zenith? It's straight above your head. <clears throat> yeah, how'd you get that, though? How do you get your zenith? You need a 90-degree angle. And the 90 degrees to what? The, the ground being it's flat? The, yeah, because uh, yeah. this is... Right, I'll show you. This is your zenith, OK? And this is the other side of that 90-degree right angle. Yeah, have to red flat. Line. Yeah, it has to be you, flat. No way out. You don't line it up in a zenith mirror then. That's it's what I was driving at. Really Adam, flat. Adam's. Can I just, Brian, just let Adam go for a second because he's picked up on where I was going with that. Go ahead, Adam. Yeah, yeah just being sarcastic. So there is no such thing as a zenith mirror. The way in which we calculate our zenith is by a reference to the flat baseline that we create and work from the surface on which we're dwelling. So for all those people out there chanting, well, you take it from your zenith, you don't utilise the ground. We're measuring an angle in the sky. Yeah, you're going to be minusing that from 90 to give you a ground distance. That's the point of doing this. But regardless, how did you acquire your zenith? Yeah. Well, you needed 90 degrees to a flat baseline in order to acquire it. So you're going to need Earth to be flat to be declaring you've got a zenith in the first place. We don't. You don't measure the zenith. It's located... From the accuracy of your of your parallels 
um, and the accuracy of measuring your your, angle, your elevation angle. So it's 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 derived from the measurement you take and the the flat baseline because it is it's ninety from that which you're calculating. Uh, so to summarise, Adam, first you get your flat Earth flat line baseline to measure your elevation angle. That's step one. First elevation angle, correct? Yep. yep. Can I share a slide now? Th then, then Zenith. Next. Step yep. two, after Flat Earth established and proven. Shout out to you again, Mike Jones, for the super chat. Once you've proven Earth's flat in order to establish your Zenith, then you've got your Zenith to bark Zenith at us and claim you're only making a sky measurement that's not going to be minus off 90. Go ahead, 10th. Tell me when you see it. Yep, got your protractor. All right. Sexton is a navigational tool that measures elevation using angular distances. You can use a sexton to determine the altitude in the sky of the sun, moon, or other celestial bodies relative to the horizon. So here's your sextant, glorified protractor. Here's your baseline. Here's what Brian's showing you, the GP of the star. The zenith is directly above the Earth. And then, of course, you've got a GP here. So the sextant's first measurement is the angle, okay? Now we're going to go to zenith distance of a body is the angular distance from the observer's zenith. So here's the observer's zenith, the 90. It is the complement of the body's altitude. Here's the body's altitude right here. This is the complement of that altitude. When the altitude is found by measurement, because you're measuring degrees above the horizon, with the sextant, the corresponding measured zenith distance becomes available. This is your zenith distance. This is, uh, for example, if this was 50 degrees, well, let's say 45, well, no, let's go 50. 50 degrees, that leaves you 40 when you minus it from 90, 40 times 60, that's 2,000 miles, right? So there you have your distance from GP to GP. All flat. Has to be. Yep, only, it can only be flat to do this. But with that, I'm going to say, first and foremost, a huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. After show possible? Today's live show possible. Of course, a massive thank you to all of you in Nathan Oakley live stream. Catch up with which, which show I'm actually doing right now. Uh, for smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing. Hopefully subscribing to my second channel, Nathan Oakley, if you want to keep up with the uncut and after show that for some reason I think I'm rounding out when I'm not. Once again, stay tuned if you are watching on either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley premiering stream as there will be an after show to follow. I've been Nathan Oakley and I will see you all in the next video. Measured the radius long time ago, man. Thousands of times. Where you been? <laughs> oh yeah, give me one. Yeah, they can't though, because most of like this thing, they none of them realize where the radius came from. The radius is based on what I showed a minute ago. They calculated the radius based on a flat earth. They built their radius. The, the globe is built on a flat earth. They required a flat earth to build a globe. And the radius can't be any different because it has to match Polaris. In particular, it has to match Polaris. It has to match the drop of Polaris. So they have to ignore the, if there's any optical going, thing going on or any perspective for Polaris to do what it does on their globe. So they, in particular, not just the other stars, but it has to match Polaris. So that's where the radius came from.
You said it already perfectly, Brian. They measured it on the surface, then moved that measurement to the center and gave us a, a false globe. Yep. Yeah. See, that center of the Earth mode button is, seems to be very important. It only works yeah. if the uh, it only engages that button if you've got a flat Earth to uh, utilize to get the button to work. <laughs> right. So first part of that button is measure flat plane, then engage center of Earth mode. Yep. <laughs> the the origin of the radius being starting and being built on a flat plane. And their radius just being purely based off, ha like basically based off pol the, the drop of Polaris, because it has that is their that was where their original radius came from. Um, the the equatorial radius is only be the equatorial circumference on the globe is what it has to be, because the polar circumference of the globe is a flat measurement. So when you bring that flat measurement together and you do what they did, bringing the right angle to the center of the, uh, center of a circle, their, their globe can't be any different. It can't be any bigger or any smaller. And that, in my opinion, it makes curve calculators the biggest joke ever because curve calculators wouldn't exist if it wasn't for a flat earth. They've got it labelled on it. Have you noticed on Mick West's um, uh, calculator, he's got eye level and surface level. Have you ever noticed yeah. those two lines? Just like on the celestial navigation uh, diagrams. Right. So they're telling you right there in the curve calculator, here's your eye level and here's the surface level below it, parallel with it. And nothing to do with the curved earth that we're going to assert with a geometric horizon below it. Because you've got your eye level and you've got your surface level. There they are, dotted lines out into space. The globe model only works because the earth is actually flat. That's right. That's a very true statement. If the globe model works, it's only because they've got a very accurate idea of how the flat plane works. And it's true, they had to get all these positions, right? They had to figure out where all the GPs of the stars were. And apparently this stuff's working, right? <laughs> yeah. So they figured out where places. it all is on a flat plane, got it all tracked and measured, and then they transpose what we observe in an apparent nature of a an arc of our optical dome and transpose that and when it fails they narrow it down to you only make relativity a thing talk about having gravity work from your position only to the center of a presupposed spherical earth you know they've got nothing but get outs from that point forward because obviously it's not going to work completely hey nathan um just real quick I'm trying to ask this question in chat, main chat. No one gives me a straight answer, I guess. But to any baller in here, do you want to explain what orbit or gravitational orbit is James Webb in in comparison to the moon? Or at least what you guys have been told. It's, you know, how to explain that. Because it doesn't make sense. But if you could please make it make sense. Thank you. Orbit, you said? Yeah, you'll need half of that. Thank you. And they need a flat plane for that all. That's true. Well, maybe maybe orbits are locally flat too, you know? No, just, just Brian's last statement, just a penny's just dropped. So, well, I always give John kudos for, you know, almost everything boils back to, oh, you're going to need half of that. You're going to need half of that. Oh, you'll be assuming half of that then. Well, you'll need to be assuming R for that then. Well, Brian's last statement rings a lot more true and will cause a lot more pain. Do you want to just repeat your last statement, Brian? Yes, Nathan. You'll need a flat plane for that R. You're going to need ah. a flat plane for that R value. That's right, Brian. 
oh, this this coming year is going to be riddled with baller, ex-baller, now anti-flat earther tears, isn't it, Brian? With that one statement. Yes. I'm getting serious hate uh, past few years. I'm getting serious hate past while, but my past two videos are getting a lot of hate. Me too. I keep getting sent clips by people that I don't watch. I'm <laughs> like, here's a clip. Me too. Partially because a lot of them don't play on my iPad for some reason in the format I get on Skype. But I'll get sent this clip and I'll be like, I can't play it. What's it about? And I'll get a quick verbal breakdown because, you know, whatever. And it's like this person's having a go at you because of this elevation angle argument. And they're, you know, sharing their pain over on this channel. And another person will contact me. Here's a here's an answer starting at this timestamp. I'm like, I'm not going to go and watch that. What's it about? Well, it's about this person moaning about you because they're sharing their pain about the elevation angle that they can't get off the curve. You're like, oh, yeah, yeah. There's a lot of pain out there at the moment. And a lot of it's directed at you and I and other people on this panel right now, Brian. Yes, there's a lot of pain out there. Uh, but between here and now on the Troy Tinkin server, uh, we really are soaking up the pain. Yeah, it doesn't... doesn't... It's bought her off a duck's back, though. I mean, their, their projections of the pain in these regards are pretty pitiful. You know, like asking us how we would solve the problem of having a curved adjacent. Things like that aren't going to give you many pain relief, you know. There's, there's no respite. I know we've discussed this on past shows as opposed to you're going to need a flat plane for that R value. God, I wish I'd coined that, Brian. In fact, I think I did. This hasn't gone. This hasn't been aired yet. That's copyrighted. That's mine, Brian. How dare you? <laughs> okay, <Nathan. laughs> All you get, all you get, there's no, there's no container needed. Gravity holds out gas pressure in. Didn't you go to school? Yeah, but they're going to need a flat plane for that because they need an oar for gravity. They're not calculated. Well, could the two-body problem not also apply to lots and lots and lots of individual gas particles? Would it not be just not even in the realms of calculability. Correct. It's very limited as as to what you can do with it, right? That's why they never converted the heliocentric model to <laughs> Einsteinian gravity. They only used it as like a correction device for Mercury because they needed to, because it never worked with the Newtonian model. But for the rest, they still use the Newtonian model because the Einsteinian model just doesn't work. It doesn't, doesn't do help you build a model. Right, it doesn't do very much. So, you know, when QE points out that you ask him how the gravity is affecting, the moon's gravity is affecting Earth with the tides, well, you can't even calculate it in Einstein's field equations. It's not possible. So you go, okay, well, let's extrapolate that out to who's sniffing? Who's doing that? Is that Anthony? Negative. I was on mute. Uh, anyway. It was me, sorry. That's all right. It's not, but yeah. Thank you for admitting that and relieving my <laughs> my my accusation. <laughs> you were the only one I saw with your line on off mute, but you've got a local mute. So if you've got the same the gravitational problem with the moon, how do you explain it with Einstein's field equations when when you're talking about tides, the effect of one body on another body you can't do? Well, okay, if that can't be done, how are you supposed to extrapolate that out into massive amounts of gas particles? You can't do it either, right? Well, no. But they want to assert that bending pseudo force space time is going to hold gas here. No, can't even be done in the maths as far as I can see. Yeah, but see, the nature of the what the nature of what you guys have been talking about for the past few minutes already jumped the shark past the logic. Because in the <laughs> paradigm, gravity is an effect. Gravity is an effect, right? So they say, what causes things to fall down? Gravity. Well, gravity is the effect of things falling down. So what they're actually saying is things falling down causes things to fall down. It's ridiculous out of space. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. The force of gravity creates the force of gravity. <laughs> <laughs> no, it'd be the force of gravity creates... No, the effect of gravity creates the force of gravity? No, no. Anthony's oh, had yeah, this boiled yeah. down to him by Craig. Craig, Craig told you about something about emerging. The force of gravity causes the emergent force that, of that gravity. Was, that was that was that me. was chocolate. <laughs> was it you, chocolate? Oh, regalus, please. Yeah, you want the clip? You can listen to it. Oh, you got the clip. Oh, that'll be even better. Yes, please. Hold on. He does say that gravity causes an emergent force, which then causes gravity. 
because I, I always take oh. the piss out of him because he basically says um, the force causes the the the, accel- the what does he say? The acceleration causes the force. <laughs> well, the effect causes the cause, which causes the effect. Is what he's saying. Something like that. Yeah, it's completely backwards. And he thinks it's it, honestly it's true. Oh right, isn't that the, circular reasoning? The effect yeah. is the cause of the emergent effect. <laughs> Correct. I, I, I just want to point out just before the chocolate plays the clip that it's not just the moon and the tides that's destroyed by Einstein's relativity model, but Kepler's analemma. Uh, it's not even so much Kepler what the claims they made after, because they claim that the reason they claim that the globe moves past the sun faster in the southern summer and slower in the northern summer due to the force of gravity. But there isn't one officially in the Earth. Powerless. It's a master B when it's ready, Nathan. Okay, I'll keep an eye. But yeah, you had the same problem, not just with Einsteinian, but back in the day when we, uh, in shows gone by, broke down the fundy anti-flat earthers, although they weren't called that then. Assertions of Newtonian in name only, gravity, which is to say that when you formulate the (laughs) Cavendish experiment into a hypothesis, you end up with, if mass, then mass attracts mass. Yeah, but that is their claim, though, isn't it? That checks out. If mass, then mass attracts mass. That's what a lot of them think. Yeah, but, no, I know. But, but yeah, I know that's what they think. But when you formulate it that into a hypothesis, if then if if A, then A causes A. <laughs> it's more along the lines of if Smurf, then Smurf in Smurf. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes. And yes. every yes, time I hear somebody Every time I hear somebody say mass attracts mass, right, and they believe it, it always makes me think about maths attract maths. Aha. Yeah, but it's if, if mass, well, then mass attracts mass. That's the formulation well, of their stupid hypothesis in this regard. Well, can I, can I give it to you from a well, goal and approve it? I'll go ahead, citation, please. Let's have it. Okay, so here's the, here's the most classical formulation that you'll find when a glober is trying to prove gravity, essentially it will boil down to, after they use a bunch of fluffy language, if things fall down, then things falling down causes things to fall down. Evidence of experiment, I'll drop something and it will fall down. (laughs) Oh, look at that balloon. (laughs) So you know what's crazy? Um, When they say mass attracts mass, and I go, look at that plume of smoke. They have responded at least in the in the last week with, well, it, it it's really for things on a planetary scale. Well, then how does a planet become a planet then? Yeah, that goes... Then, why did you bring that up when you talked about dropping a pen? <laughs> That's the same thing I told you. They say no, it it does not apply to gases. It only applies to things that have substance or weight. But that that's their claim of a uh, pressure gradient. They claim gravity creates the pressure gradient. Correct. No, forget no, forget all that. Like y'all are, <laughs> y'all are too y'all are too close to home. I'm talking about everything in the in the religion that is space. How did all of these planet sized and beyond things become that yeah if it takes that to enact the force of gravity let me summarize it you know yeah, you're exactly. saying when they when they claim that you've got to be at a planetary scale for this stuff to apply it defies their claims of gravitational accretion in the first respect you wouldn't have planets forming planets if it only applied at a planetary scale when they do it further to that they're only doing that to beg the question So, for example, if you ask them to show gas pressure without a container and they say gravity, and you go, show me gravity forming gas pressure without a container, they then beg the question of a sphere Earth being the scale that can achieve gas pressure without a container. It's just a way of begging the question. But ultimately speaking, you're right. Their their route to beg the question of a sphere Earth that has enough gravity to hold gas pressure without a container means they defy their own description of gravitational accretion. Well, you know, if gravity supposedly gathers all this material up in order to form planets and the galaxy is an ongoing thing, well, why are there no 
pre-planets? Why are there no? Oh, look! All oh, this, this there are. the cloud of dust is there almost are. forming. There are. There are. There are the narrative. Right? Yes, there are. There are. Almost there are. Planet. Oh my God! He won't shut up. There are. It's called the Pillars of Creation. Hubble has got telescopic pictures, imagery, as they claim, coloured in because it's in a light frequency we can't see, that looks like clouds exactly as you've just described. They're called the Pillars of Creation. Courtesy of no, but hold on. That's different because those are more like the the forming of a sun and a solar system. There's no little clots of dust gathering to become little planets. Wrong. It's they just claim, a no, cloud. Wrong, it's assumed they, that planets wrong. will form there. Yeah. Yeah. It, okay. You've dropped that into the end. Yeah. It's assumed that that's what's happening all over the place. Yes. Right, but no actual clots of planets forming within such dust clouds, right? Which is the entire assumption in the heliocentric type of formation. Correct, correct. And the heliocentrist response, when you point this out, would be to say that you haven't got enough scale in terms of time to see that formation. Well, that's nonsense because there's trillions and exactly. trillions of galaxies out there and planets, and there should always be some planet somewhere in that state and there because is. of the sheer uh, preponderance uh, 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 of planets. Uh, yeah. And the heliocentric reply, yeah, according to my heliocentric nonsense, there is. But when you look back through the stars, I look back through time because they're so far away and have taken such a long time to get here. You're only seeing a single snapshot like you would in our own local vicinity. So you're not going to see the formation because that takes a very long time to occur. So you're just seeing a little bit of it and you are seeing it everywhere. Back to my original bullshit. You're... You're getting too good at this, Nathan. I'm going to go you ball, uh, Nathan. Getting? Do you think Baldwin's the only one who can fight a globe earth argument? I would kick I Baldwin's know, ass. I know. I'm just letting you come out of that closet now. Out of the but, closet? But seriously, <laughs> but seriously, there are no actual like early formation of planetary formation. There's no video of that. There's always the clouds, stars supposedly suggested to form, but there's never ever like, oh, look, in this cloud, there's this part where it's a little bit more dense. It seems like they're gathering into a planet. You never see any kind of snapshot or suggestion of that in any... Uh, the resolution. Not a high enough resolution. So when you're talking about the scale of creating ah. a, a sun, you can see that in the Pillars of Creation. But when you scale that down at almost any distance that it's likely to occur, you, we just don't have the resolution. I mean, But it is definitely occurring in my begging the question assumption of a orbital-based heliocentric bullshit world of a sphere Earth. It is oh, definitely oh, still damn happening. Damn you, you just, Nathan. You're out ball winning me. This... Oh, and on, on screen. Can you see on screen? Yeah. So here's where the sun will be, look. And down here... You see a moon forming, and here, this is the early beginning. <laughs> Polonium. There you people. go. That Shut is the up. Pillar. Sorry, mm -hmm. this is this is just for just for reference sake. Like, this is the pillars of creation. So this is what I was just referring to, courtesy of Hubble. This is called the pillars of creation. I'm not seeing any planetary yeah. condensing oh. of cloud visual. I'm not seeing any visual congregation that would suggest the formation of a planet. Here. Yeah. And you're not and just saying that it's happening there doesn't actually yeah. convince me. Uh, science no, denier. that's not a planet formation. That's you're a science bullshit. denier. Yeah. Screw you, Smurf. <laughs> anyway, I think that's ready and uh, master be. Oh, perfect. Why, we'll, why not we'll, just we'll, go? We'll come back to that, but I just want to touch on something that Arwen did say that was definitely relevant when he's jokingly saying oh you're out ball winning me well no anybody who's good at debate understands their, their opponent's position better than their opponent does that's what it takes to win so when they come back with a rebuttal you already know it so that you can work your way around it in the way that it needs to be worked around in other words there's no surprises well, when you reach that stage, like Arwen, and to be frank, anybody on the G Plus panel, I can't vouch for you on the Discord server. It doesn't mean I'm not saying you're at the same stage, but I can vouch for every single... Let's just have a quick look. Yeah, every single person on this panel is at the stage where they would outballer any baller you can present me with. And I would say that for any single person. Neil, Brian, Adam, Arwen, Chocolate, Sleeping Warrior, John, Eli... Tenth and Brian, who's on twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we can all out. I want to hear them. chocolates clip. 
True. But, it just it just kind of sucks when you're assuming or you're approaching the situation from a ball believer perspective, and then somebody out priests you. It's always like, oh damn it. <laughs> but you did a great job. But it's still it's like not convinced. Like my ball win is not convinced. I don't see the formation of any planetary dust thing that's gonna form a ball. I don't see it in there. It's all very beautiful, but. I don't see planetary formation. Uh, we're gonna Why get not? Yeah. Why we're wouldn't they have just said meteorites? Okay, go ahead. Forget well, we're going to get to chocolate's clip in a second, but I just want to say a couple of things about this, which is we're majoring on the miners, and it's the miners that the person presenting this from the ball side, if there was such a person here now doing that, would be mainly focused on, which is you know what they imply based on the paradigm. So what is this? Well, if we ignore the fact that this is coloured in, quite literally, by men, from frequencies of light that we cannot even see, supposedly taken from a <sighs> Hubble in a sky vacuum. Now, that's not to say these images aren't real of the sky or that when, you know, altered, they will come out in this manner if you were to do the same and have the same capabilities. But the narrative says that this picture has been taken from space of things in space, and space being a sky vacuum. So this is gas that's coalescing Right, moving towards forming stars. That's moving closer and closer together. It's in a vacuum. It is defying the nature of gas in this picture based on the narrative. So no, let's just focus on what the picture is claimed to be by the people who made it and coloured it in. They say this is the formation of stars in a sky vacuum. No, that's a violation of the second law of thermodynamics. And if the area of space they're claiming this image was taken from was a sky vacuum, we on Earth would all be dead. So let's not concern ourselves with whether it was Sophia or Hubble that took it, because it doesn't matter. The narrative that is attached to this coloured in image is of a sky vacuum in violation of natural law for this story they've told about these coloured in clouds to be true. Right. Yeah, it's yeah, an I artist just, interpretation. I just want to say... That's the thing. It's an artist interpretation of data. So the original data would like look nothing like this. Then the artists were made to like spice it up, make it more presentable to the public, to the wider public that doesn't just like consume raw data and make it into this. So this is an artist's interpretation. Yeah, but well, there's what, a, what, what a lot of you don't realize, sorry, one second, John, but a lot of you don't realize is that after the Big Bang, pre-gravity worked on the small scale. And once everything came together, all the pre-gravity became larger scale gravity. And that's why it only works on the large scale now. That's correct. Oh, you say no, no, he's right. Hold on, he's got a point. <laughs> yeah. Hold on. So he's saying that it was the pre-gravity that turned into the actual gravity, which then became the emergent gravity, which was the cause of the effect, which <laughs> made the effect the cause. Correct, Brian? That yes, takes so. That's exactly it. Perfect. Um, Go ahead, John. I, I don't know. I don't even know if I can follow that nonsense. <laughs> <laughs> that was great, though. <laughs> <laughs> I can't. That was high that. standard nonsense. I've got to agree. Gravity became gravity. <laughs> <laughs> Straight out of my ass. Go on. I was. I was going to say that oh, there's a description. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, I don't. We're going to lose the segue to think. chocolate's clip if we're not careful. Go ahead, John. Well, I was going to bring it back, back to that by talking about the force they're asserting when they show these pictures. Uh, it's got a, a radial value in it, doesn't it? That's correct. That could be a oh, let's see if we can line this up. You say it, then Brian, you follow. Go ahead, John. Well, the force they're asserting has a radial value in it. So you're going to need R for that. Uh, how do you, how do you get how do you get that R? Yeah, you're right. going to you're gonna need, a, need a flat plane for that R, John. Bingo! You guys are all ignoring a you vital just, piece just of to, evidence, though. Just need to you're put all a ignoring a vital piece of evidence. We need to put a bit more spit and polish on that, lads, but that's basically perfect. <laughs> Go ahead, citation, please. Yeah, so you're forgetting that they modeled in computer software gravitational accretion and it was successful. There's and only one problem with that piece of evidence. They had to add a stickiness factor to the matter. So 
basically their own modeling of their gravitational accretion debunked itself. But that's that pre gravity. But then they added. No, no, that's, oh, no, no, that's, but, that's but, but, but did, not, did a post ad hoc fallacy follow? Citation, please. Ah, uh, you know what? That's what it sounds like. It, it went dark it went matter. From pre -gravity. It went from pre gravity to Velcro gravity, then gravity. <laughs> <laughs> of course. How is gravity doing anything? Yeah, I think we've Sorry? exhausted this. Yeah, you're just oh, you making the like questions for every right? question we ask. Gravity isn't a force thing. If well, anybody gravity. was wondering how Craig would get on with the housekeeping questions, now you know. He begs the question for every answer. That's what he does. That's how he got on. He begged the question at every opportunity. He assumed his fundy belief to answer every question. Hey, Nathan, how do you convert into plumbers? Well, Craig, are, are, are you doing what, what George Mooser told you to do? Uh, that, you know, gravity's not a force, but you can think of it as one? Is that what you're doing right now? Are you thinking of gravity as a force? I, I don't need to think of gravity as a force because there is a force created by gravity. Oh, gravity now creates a, cause. a force. What, what's the force yeah. that gravity creates? What's that? It's the well, it creates an oh. acceleration of about like what Hello? meters squared on Earth. It, you haven't, you haven't. That's a number. You have a name for that force. What, what's the force that gravity creates? I don't want a number. An, an emergent force. An emergent force. What the hell is that? You know, what emergent means. Can you define? Can you define that for us? It means it's a consequence. And can you cite else. that afterwards? What's the consequence of? I didn't hear what you said. Nathan spoke over you. Can, uh, can you, you define say? emergent force that gravity yes, creates I just did. and then cite that for us, please? Yes. Absolutely. Uh, gravity is an emergent force, as in it is a consequence of something. Wait, wait, wait. Else. No, it is an emergent it. force or it creates one? Because now you're, you're flipping your words. You just said it creates a force. Now you're saying it is the force. Yes. Um, when 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 we say gravity is a force, that's a colloquial thing, all right? There is a force created by what we call gravity, uh, the, and they, we call that the force of gravity. Okay? Who are you? Gravity, so the gravity creates the force of gravity? That's what you just said. <laughs> are you serious? No, no I said that... that, that Do you know what you're saying right now, Craig? Oh, yeah, can you demonstrate that? Yeah, the, the, this has been demonstrated many times. What you seem to be stuttering, Craig. Does gravity create the force of gravity? Because that's what you just said. No, or is no, it the um, emergent okay, force that you are about to cite for us? Is, which one is what it? What I'm saying is, is that there is a, a force that is measurable. Okay, We call that the force of gravity. All right? But gravity is what is creating the, the force. It's force the gravity. Gravity. So you said it again. The you said it again. again the, the, <laughs> I'm trying What's to, this measurement? Itself, please. You said Wow. Classic. I can I see how he started so much. I can see how irritating it is from the other side, the chocolate. chocolate. When someone's talking through your really good points, that was me on that occasion. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's all good. The amount of stuttering that he was doing, I didn't realize it at the time. And that's why my man Chocolate should accompany me. He knows where. I know where to. It's like a little in-joke secret. You do know where, <laughs> actually. <laughs> I'm aware of the in-joke, so I'll agree to. But he should. Yeah, so do I. Oh, now you're getting baller quiet on us, Chocolate. Come on, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> don't put pressure on him. Look, plus with the audience doesn't know what we're talking about, so let's drop it anyway. What happened? Uh, we were talking secret society, Mason Shill stuff. Nothing important. <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so the force of gravity creates the force of gravity, so that's great. I would like to know where we should meet you. Sorry, you on a different call, uh, Neil? No, I'm on the outside. Outside as in on remand? Yeah, I would like to know where Chocolate needs to meet Eli to destroy ballers. Oh, you're not privy to that information, Neil. I see.
you know, something else funny about Newtonian mechanics, um, it's presuming that the earth is not spinning. That's like every equation uh, doesn't account for that. Because it's not spinning. Oh, hold on, you have to expand on what that. You... Hold on, let me just switch into 107 year out of date Newtonian mechanical world. Click. There we go. Can you explain that for me? <laughs> Yeah, it's all of the equations are taking place in an inertial reference frame. There is there is not a non-inertial reference frame in Newtonian mechanics. The non-inertial turning reference frame in a description of Coriolis is the turning Earth. If you're saying the descriptions come from the inertial reference frame, that would be, in the case of the Coriolis description at least, your hot air balloon that's not attached to Earth. You're saying the Newtonian descriptions come from the inertial reference frame, but there's no inertial, no non-inertial no. reference frame referenced. Is that what you're saying? Well, there's no turning Earth reference within Newtonian mechanics. It's all take, takes place in an inertial plane. Whenever you look at the the math to it, there's no accounting for a non-inertial turning reference frame. Can anybody challenge him on this? Can anybody say that you're wrong? No, he does refer to a non-inertial turning reference frame, presumed to be Earth, in the hundred. Is it 107? Yeah, 107 year out of date rhetoric that is in name only Newtonian. Can anybody challenge this? I just don't want to agree with you and say, "Wow, that's amazing," because you know, as much as I'd like to think I'm pretty good with Newtonian gravity, I don't know it all. So, who can I lean on? There's Adam? a reason it's out of date yeah but it's still fascinating if he's correct i just don't know whether he is or yeah isn't. oh yeah New newtonian mechanics simplifies so much that's one of the the main points you learn when you take a high school physics course is we're not accounting for air resistance we're not accounting for the spin of the earth we're not accounting for any of these things that's kind of why it was abandoned because it doesn't really it simplifies everything and removes as many variables as are deemed insignificant which still have an effect but it's not significant enough that he cared about it what has an effect the the, the inertial uh, sorry non-inertial turning reference frame not being referred to by newton in his mechanics but you know if it's not referred to if there's if there's zero reference to it and you're saying that you, when educated on it, we're given disclaimers that, no, we have to consider us as stationary when doing this. Not have to consider, just that it has an effect. It's not that it is. Oh, In general, when, when, you're, when you do it, the effect is insignificant. I, I was going to say negligible. Insignificant, you say. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that sounds Same way. But that's, that's why I asked what effect. That's why I asked what effect. Is this uh, is the man talking about? The effect Earth would have as a Just turning reference frame. Yeah. I mean, I think it was Citation Police earlier that was point pointing out all the different vectors, and I gave a shout out to Ute Hube because he was barking on about it a few years back, saying we didn't, you know, we were shills and stuff because we didn't talk about it. <laughs> shout out to you, Ute Hube. Well. Well, I think the lad, the lad talking to a medical, was he a, a, a baller? Um, that, that. No, I don't think so. But based on his tone, Jonathan, are you a baller? Uh, yeah. Oh, wow. I called that wrong. Yes, he is. Yeah, I thought so. Cause <laughs> when so did say, I. Well, yeah, because he, he, I knew from the way you, you said, Jonathan, a couple, you, you mentioned our turn, and I can't remember what else, and you said it would be negligible. Just the way you were speaking, I knew you were a baller. Because I knew that you were factoring them in as a reality. But to answer your question, Nathan, about the Newtonian um, physics applying to that non-inertial turning reference, isn't that their assumption that we're being held to the to the Earth while it spins, and that when you're trapped in that little gravity air pocket bubble, that suddenly makes you be spinning at a thousand miles when you're stationary? That's their link with the gravi the Newtonian gravity to maybe, that maybe, rotating but, reference. Maybe, but not according to the guy that just spoke a second ago called Jonathan, because he's saying 
No, there is an effect. It's just in the maths, it's considered negligible. I trigger ballers all day. Yeah, I'm just saying I when like you it. do the math using Newtonian physics, you don't account for a lot of things that you deem negligible, like um, how weight at different latitudes is different. You don't you don't account for that. You don't say, oh, at this latitude, it's going right. to be 0.5 newtons less. Straight. You've just thrown in the Atmos effect, right? That's yeah. I'm just throwing in things that I've seen. Atmos effect. You've seen that, have you? Just math that I've seen relating math. to math. What about the effect? The the Atmos effect. I don't know enough about to accurately speak you on. Just claimed it. I only know enough about. You just claimed it. I'm only talking about you just claimed things it. that I can accurately Hello? speak on. Hello. Hello. 25 seconds ago, you just claimed it. I just claimed, oh, because I've seen math relating to it. That's all I know. Right. Is well, that there is that so people no have accounted effect, for the effect and say, oh, this is what the difference would be. If there was an effect. Have you seen that effect to validate that is actually an effect? If I had the money to travel, I would. Is that a no? <laughs> it's a no. But do, do you that, get the basic? Sorry, the just basis need you to concede, saying, right? typical baller. Yes, so we'll try that once more. Do I need to slow down, or will you have the balls to concede? Do you get? Do you get the basis of what I'm saying, though? Do you that get the basis of my mechanics, annihilation of your of claim of that? Do, do you get it? That's do you think you need to ask I'm me saying. what I get and chant nonstop? Do you get that I've, I've just at, taken your I've claim? Made, I've, made, Shut up. I've made one Stop. real point in that Newtonian Stop. mechanics don't Stop account talking. for a lot of things. You're getting irritating real fast, Jonathan. You've asked me okay. why I stopped <laughs> talking. Hello? Oh, I'm irritated. Oh, I'm so concerned. Yeah. You're going to stop talking long enough for me to point out that which you've yet to concede, which is that your claim of at boss effect only exists in maths. That's not a valid effect that you can experience well, there in have any been, way. There, have there been he is again, done. triggered. Triggered as some will help, because obviously he's made a claim that's been annihilated by a flat earther and he's yet to concede. So he's going to chant straight through the middle of me reiterating it for the third time. Maybe he'll ask me what I need to concede at the end of this point that he's yet to concede about Atmos effect, which isn't real. You're going to concede it? I just want to... There are experiments that have been done. Do you want me to just do my own in order to prove it? Is that the only way? What's been done? Or can, am what's I allowed done? to trust other Sorry, experiments? Sorry, what's been done? We're still claiming done. it then. Okay, what's been done to validate this effect? Uh, there's been an image posted in general a lot of a plane flying one direction and the other direction and the weight of an object measured with a graph on it. That's what I've seen on it. Sorry, a That's graph. an experiment? A graph? That is an a graph of something being measured on a plane as it moves direction. Does this sound like a naturally occurring phenomenon to you? Well, yeah, the weight of the object Sorry, is you a think naturally occurring weighing phenomenon. Weighing stuff in planes is naturally occurring phenomena. You, you think that's natural? The weight of the object is natural, and then we can we could move it by hand and walk with it. Sorry, we could use to, a plane because slow the down effect the question, will be more you visible. Don't, you don't seem to understand. You seem to be answering in the positive. No, because just saying, oh, a plane doesn't occur in nature is not valid reason to deny a scientific experiment. Uh, sorry, things, it's not things. science if it's not occurring in nature. It's not a naturally occurring phenomena, so you're not going to be sciencing it. First step of the scientific method is to observe a naturally occurring phenomena. This isn't that. Etvos effect, it's not real. It only exists in your graph. Still yet to concede it. Fourth try. The graph is a measurement of weight, which would show the Etvos effect. Sorry, this is a, back to the same point you've just ignored completely then. Not a naturally occurring phenomenon, my friend. Not something you've got scientific validity for. Just a man-made folly that you've attributed a graph to. Not a natural phenomenon. Second attempt with that one. Still yet to concede my five attempts that Etvos effect only exists in this graph. Well, no, it exists outside of the graph. The graph is just a measurement. Uh, what's the naturally phenomena that's occurred, please? Well, the Etvos effect would be the phenomena. Uh, where's we'd that observe observed? that what's, happen, what's and observed? then we'd say, what causes yeah, What's observed? Don't just beg the question. The, the observation is the weight changing what observation? as the plane moves one direction yeah, That's not other. natural. You don't understand the word natural. You're thick. So Does I'll try the again. Object's weight I'll try do, again do without you chanting straight through me. Weight? Yeah, triggered fundy. You're going to chant straight through me. Yeah, you've lost. 
Not a natural phenomena. Don't give me your man. Do we add weight? Yeah. Hello, he's going to chant straight through the middle and be because he's unreasonable and a globe believer. Yeah, maybe from the comments, ask why. Normally at this point, I get very irritated with this wanker. Yeah, he won't shut up because he's lost. He hasn't got a naturally occurring effect to justify his faith in a graph that details. Do I add weight? There he goes again. Unreasonable wanker. He doesn't like my summary of his loss. So mid-sentence, he's going to start chanting through me because that's what happens when you lose. He doesn't have a natural phenomena to justify his faith in a graph based on men fiddling with scales in aeroplanes. That's not a natural phenomena. That's the third time, my friend. So, no boss effect. It only exists in your graph. Nathan, could I ask this guy about Atvos effect? Sure. Can you hear me okay? Coming through loud and clear. No, he's Not asking you. the guy, the guy we were talking, talking about to. Atvos. Has he, has he disappeared? Oh, Jonathan! Has he run away? Has he liked it? Yeah, he got, he, he got muted by a mod. Guys, don't let Why? Nathan moderate the show when he's on the show. The fuck? Okay. No, no, that's what he wanted. What he started doing, Righteous, was just chanting straight through the middle of every summary of his loss. Mid-sentence, he'd chant through the middle of it. So people in Discord get pissed off and go, I want to hear how he lost, but he won't let us hear because he's going to chant through the middle of it that he has got a natural phenomena as I detail how it's not a natural phenomena. He did that three times. So eventually, what he's aiming for is, oh, no, I only left because I got muted. Not because I got annihilated and wouldn't concede and every single repetition of it was painful enough for me to have to blart through it every time. That's not what he wants to concede. He wants to get muted so he can remove himself and have a nice little excuse to tell his mates, I didn't lose, I got muted. I was trying to chant my third I'm rendition that aeroplanes were natural. He's back. He's back. He's back. Jonathan, can I say one everyone thing else, can you be quiet just, for a second? Uh, Jonathan, uh, Jonathan. I've, I've made three attempts to summarise your loss there, but on all three separate occasions, you chanted through me and people around you are getting annoyed that you're not letting me summarise your devastating loss in regards to this non-natural phenomena you detailed from a graph known as Epos effect. It's not real. I, I just want to ask a question to you. You haven't answered me. Oh, really? So rather than concede the point I've made three times and you've chanted through on every separate occasion, when you actually listen to it, you think you've got a question you need answering? No. That's my fourth attempt for me to get you to concede the claim you made in the first instance of Etvos Effect. You haven't done it. It's not time for a question of me. It's not time for you to continually chant through me. It's time for you to concede you don't have a naturally occurring phenomena or any science to back your fantasy belief in a graph of Etbos effect. That's six attempts. When the object's weight when the object's weight changes, does a human add the weight to the object or remove weight from Where the object? Where does this occur in nature? Does a human Where add or... does it occur in nature's my response? A repetition of the question isn't what's required. An answer to the question you've ignored five times is required. This isn't a natural phenomena. So in response to your question about things being weighed, I ask where it occurs in nature and you chant the same thing through me because you've lost. So I'll answer my own question. Oh, no, you will not. You'll get told in summary by me, the show host, that you've lost because you haven't answered my question in regards to your claim of science for it, boss, which would be step one, natural phenomena. You don't have one. Does the object's weight... So time for a question. No, Fundy. Doesn't work that way. When you get a devastating loss presented to you, it's not just time for you to chant out a question of me. It's time for you to grow a pair of balls and concede that your fantasy Etvos effect only exists in your graph and has no naturally occurring phenomena. It's not time for you to bark out a question of me. Hey, Numpty Dipshit, are you retarded or something? Jonathan. Am I, oh, I'm not muted. You yelled Keep muted. saying the same you. fucking thing over and over again. I just want an answer to the question. It's yes or no question. Do you what? have an answer? No claim. 
right? My you my question is, is shut up. Yelling doesn't get you. You anywhere. said this was. I'm gonna fucking kick your ass out of this server. One second. Oh, okay. That's okay. what he wants. Really well, angry. Why don't you wants. just stop so pretending what he wants. like you can yeah. ask another no, he's question? He's behaving like a total wanker. So he gets removed. So he never has to concede. The Etvos effect doesn't exist in physical reality. There's no natural phenomena. Conjuring one on an aeroplane with some scales and putting it on a graph doesn't make this a natural phenomena he can science. He's had it six times. He's chanted through five attempts and then said, no, I've got a question of you when this devastating defeat comes my way. Now, we're not going to move Can I on. say something to him? Oh, Just is this scientific evidence? Right? So what's the hypothesis for the Etvos effect, please? And I want you to say it. I want both parts of it right now. Let, let me let me reiterate something here. I came in here. To I said, give me the hypothesis I, right now. I came in here to fuck off. He's done. No more. Yeah, what an asshole. Not willing to do anything other than chant out his fundamentalist zealotry in regards to Etvos effect. And unless we accept his fundamentalist zealotry, he's not going to be here and tolerate us talking. He'll just chant through us. And what I'm here for, after six attempts to get him to concede his loss... No, no, we're not interested in what you're here for. You've already laid out a claim. Etvos effect. We've annihilated it six times. Are we getting any concession? No, we're not. We're getting told that we're unreasonable for stopping him chanting through the summary. Yeah, but he got what he wanted. He got what he wanted, which was to be kicked no. off, because that way he didn't have to concede. Correct. What was going on with him, what was, going on with, him was there was an effect, they call it the eat force effect. It's not a naturally observed phenomenon, so it's not a natural effect. So the problem with this eat force effect is it's based around the pre-assumption that we are rotating. So that's where it all comes back to. Exactly. It's a, a back-in-the-question fallacy for Earth rotation. Perfect. It's a and presuppositional and assuming <laughs> model. Uh, and they never, like, whatever, the, fa the effect was a man-made effect. Yeah. But if they ever really wanted to find out what caused it, they'd have to actually investigate it. So even within their non-science, pseudo-science situation, they've never investigated it. They just went, that's our turn. You know what I mean? Okay, I want yeah, Anthony. Yeah. Also, uh, 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 everyone else, hold on. Anthony's been waiting in the wings trying to get a word in on that boss effect for a while. Go ahead, Anthony. Well, I was hoping to speak with Jonathan. Is he still here or has he been kicked? No, he's been kicked. He's removed himself when he got muted and chanting kicked. through QE asking him for scientific evidence. Because I just want to remind Can people on our side that the, pre the minute you hear the word Etvos, you need to be thinking of there is a counter to this that is real world, that is a naturally occurring phenomena. Because they claim that Earth rotates and it makes things appear to go, uh, what is it, heavier and, and lighter as a, f a function of east and west travel. Well, we do see a naturally occurring phenomena with north to south travel. And on their model, if Etvos is caused by rotation of the Earth, you would expect boats to appear to be lighter as they get to the equator. But in real world, we see that they sink as they get towards the equator because they appear to get heavier, contrary to the claim of Etvos, which is caused by Earth rotating, where they must get lighter. In real world, Hold we get on. It. That's not technically correct. It's because the temperature differentials, right? The oceans at the equator regions are warmer, causing ships to sink deeper within them. Yeah, Their you know, weight yeah, doesn't change. Yeah, you know who told you that, Arwin? Sleeping warrior. Yeah, I know, and I'm reminding him of it. Yeah, I know, technically speaking, their claim it requires the rotation of the Earth to make boats appear to be lighter as they get towards the equator and more heavy when they get away from the equator because the rotation of the Earth is acting on the boat. But in real world, we see things sink as they get towards the equator and that we see that they are more buoyant, as they would call it, as they get away from the equator. So it's a direct contradiction of their claim that Etvos effect is causing an effect, because if it was causing an effect, boats would appear to be lighter in the water as they get to the equator, not heavier. Not an effect right, we observe, it's just a beg in the... Spin. It's not an effect we observe, it's just a beg in the question fallacy, as Brian pointed out. Right. And can you argue there is a real differential, and it is temperature-based, not spin-force-based. That's Correct. the point. Yeah, Correct, yeah. but I just want, I'm not arguing that as a flat earth, I'm pointing out on uh, the model. Yeah, just, Sleeping Warrior is now about to summarise that he doesn't need to make the claim, he's about to do a good thing. Let yeah, him do I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not claiming, I'm not explaining the reasons for why it does or it doesn't. What I'm saying is on their model, it requires things to get apparently lighter as it gets through the equator, but in real world, it doesn't. 
Roger. Dude, Roger. Turn your go. mic off. Roger, can you go on mute? Oh, sorry. That's okay. Don't worry. The Get relative up. position. The John, relative Jared. position of. <laughs> Yeah, John. The relative position of the boat is staying the same. The water is getting lighter. If you like. Yeah, that's the flight answer, bottle, isn't it? <laughs> it's not needed. I'm just challenging the John's train. now thrown himself in the firing board. line. Hold on, sleep more. So not Arwen, lighter, less dense. Uh, Arwin skirted that border. And what Sleepy Mori points out was, I don't need to make any claims in this regard because we're opposing or rebutting a claim of Etvos effect. Now, that doesn't require Anthony, who does know and does understand this stuff, and he's the one who's disseminated this information, to have it now pointed out, but that makes us in the position of having a claim to defend. You know, that might be true, what Anthony researched in the regards to why that might happen, or it might not, but it's not integral to any claim we're making, so there's no need to discuss it. And sorry you've got the end of this bullet rather than I win, John, but that's just the way it is. You don't. Who cares why that happens? Does it matter? No, but they're claiming oh, the complete no. opposite. No, I was just, I was getting ready to point out how when you attack Newton, ballers get triggered. No, and it, it is true. Take it that is, bullet. It is, it is true. Bullet, go on, Brian. Go on, Eli. I go after, well, Eli was going to say something. Go, go on, Eli. I'm, I'm a bit confused. What does North and South have to do with their claim about East and West? I think it's just the north south. It's just that they claim as you go towards the equator, things get lighter. As you move away from the equator, north or south, things get heavier. But the, do it, they? It, I thought it was no, east and west. Uh, yes, no, because of the assumed spin. Centrifugal. Yeah, that's why. It doesn't. Centrifugal the, 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 force. The, what Anthony is talking about is the plimsoll line on the ships. So ships have to load in accordance with what water they're going to be traveling in. Because if they're into warmer water, the, the water is less dense. So the ship doesn't have as much buoyant um, abilities, I shall say. It's like no one's listening. So now Arwin, John and Brian have all done the same thing. Yes, we're very grateful for Anthony originally two years ago giving us this information and doing the thorough research required to attack anybody should be challenged on it. But amongst friends right now, None of us need to be detailed. I'm glad it's going out. I'm glad people are learning it. It's it's useful information, which you can go out and check. I double-checked it. So was Arwen by the sounds of things. And it was Anthony that originally came up with the information. But it's not integral to any claim we're making, Brian. <laughs> so No, no. I, I, no but it's I, laying the right. grounds of information, right? Uh, the well, ballers, well, but the no, ballers use information constantly and try to rearrange oh it in order to make it into a global claim. And we're just pointing out, this is the data. This is where they lent their machination data from. Okay. Now, I, 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 no, I gave Flat Earth data props the same. But old news, Anthony's already had the props. Rehashing it just is good. And I'm glad it's happened. But by the same token, it's a useful opportunity for me to say this isn't necessary. And while someone's going to end up in the firing line as a result, that's just the way it is. Shit sandwich time. Because kudos to John. He was trying to take props that never came his way in regards to triggering triggering the globe to actually discuss this with us that jonathan guy was reaction to uh to john and his comment so you know props for john and then citation police has got something to add so i'm sure john wants to say something then citation please go ahead but you still <laughs> i mean i feel like it's like oh fuck what eli said because well yeah i feel like it didn't well, no no let's no i'm sorry saying. let's let's <laughs> clarify that and actually you know put a rubber stamp on it yeah fuck what eli says john go ahead <laughs> <laughs> I just uh, that it surprises happen. me how much they they need Newton. They like, they they want to keep Newton, but they realize he's not their claim anymore. I just yeah, but, oh. but that's because he's the only one that could sculpt. I would shut up so he can go. Jeez, so, citation can go <laughs> so I can come back. Right, citation police. You're gonna have to wait. Eli, go ahead. I thought that. His whole claim had to do with east and west rotation as it as as they're detailing centrifugal forces. What does that have to do with north and south? The variance occurs, Eli, as you change your north south position in terms of your east west rotation. So at the equator, you're spinning your fastest, aren't you? Your rotational supposed rotational rate is faster than at say 45 degrees. 
right? The, cent okay, the centripetal you, force you, is higher. That's right, at the equator. Thank you. Yeah, if you spin a ball, things are going to go towards its uh, center point. Right, it's rim velocity or edge velocity. Okay, go ahead, citation, please. All right. So what we've heard this whole past time is postulating how their model would or should work. But Jonathan actually defeated himself because his assertion on the table was that the weight changes on its own. So he already asserted the cause that it's self-caused. In other words, weight change is caused by weight change. So at that point, he's logically incoherent. He hasn't presented any evidence. He hasn't presented any scientific validation. He is saying that the effect causes the effect. Okay. Yes, hold on. At yeah, this yeah, point. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Yes, you're correct. Yeah, he didn't get to that stage though, so that's my bad. And just in case someone in the comments says, Whoa, you cut him off. Yeah. The moment he made the claim, it didn't matter that he took his circular reasoning and inserted his sphere belief. He didn't get to that stage, did he? But that's my bad if you wanna if you wanna hold that against him, that's a bit unfair. He wasn't allowed to get there because once he'd made a claim, okay, if we're gonna move forward with this at boss effect that needs to be established first before we get anywhere near his funding insertion of a sphere belief right the atmos effect rests on the assumption that all weight is what it is because of a force of gravity applied to it and that the centripetal force of the spinning ball earth counteracts that weight that gravity a little at the equator and that's what the idea is based on yeah, but what he came in originally was he was speaking about the difference between the now accepted relativity model as opposed to the old and busted Newtonian model. But then he goes starts and starts speaking about weight. <laughs> Where did you get the weight? I mean, you, I have an your idea. model doesn't have weight if you don't have Newtonian. So you know wait, I mean? if I take if I take gold and bring it to another part of the world, it's going to weigh more. No. Wouldn't people no, be making millions? No. No, it's not that big a difference. But yes, the, there's been conspiracy theories about <laughs> like gold exchanges at the north and, and at the equator, yeah, supposedly but, for profit. Yeah, but that's based but on that's air just pressure. conspiracy theory. Yeah, but that's, that's air pressure differences that will change the weight a little bit. So if you have a lot of gold, it might weigh a little bit more in a different part of the world depending on the air pressure. Where, where you are, if you're at the equator, there will be a difference in the weight of your, your gold, if you have a load of gold than if you're far north or south. Well, of course. To, of course. Be to the, because of the relative yeah. density uh, disequilibrium. No, uh, yeah, but no, it's down to convection. Now, can we clarify that we will say that the scale works differently? We, we jump into the assumption that the weight or whatever has changed, has it, or is the apparatus operating differently correct that needs to be clarified that's first. exactly where i was going with him so what we're talking about is a man-made gizmo if you want to say that my accuracy of scale is x on a plane traveling at this distance well that's like troubleshooting uh enhancing your technology for scales that's what that is that's technology that's not science it has everything to do with the man-made devices being used to qualify a convention we've come up with, in this case, weight. Well, does that extrapolate right. out into a man-made device or a phenomena that occurs in nature? Do things change weight, Adam? No, they do not. What an absolutely absurd notion. But they're claiming it because of a scale measurement in a different location? Well, there's a problem with your technology. It's like when they do it with the time. When they say, oh, we fly a clock up at this altitude and then we bring it back and it's at a different time. So what? It's, it's travelled through time, is it? That's, your, that's a technology issue. Sod all to do oh. with naturally occurring phenomena. Everything to do with the technology. Correct. But I have to correct you, though, because weight does actually differentiate. Weight is actually, in reality, a convention based on relative density this equilibrium stability based on a on the gas pressure at ground level but if that gas pressure is then different in a different part of the world then the weight will also be different so, so there the is actually an effective oh, no. weight difference no, no. it's just so, not because of gravity no it's not because of gravity but within the convention you've just described there's an account for it crude one albeit but that's an account for it 
So has it changed weight even in your own description? The answer is no. Correct. Yeah, the globe yeah. model doesn't account for it. We do, however. Well, things weigh more in a vacuum. So the lower the air pressure, the chances are that something is going to weigh heavier. So Did you hear that, fundies? Just, just reiterate the first part of that statement again, just for any ball believers out there who are thinking yeah. about floating around in sky vacuums and stuff, because obviously, you know, they're going to be less affected by the weight of their own body in zero G, right? No, things weigh more in a vacuum. So the lower the air pressure, then the more likely something is going to be hit way more. Right, the so differential is maximized. At the, at the equator, uh, I don't know, because it depends on convection. Convection might help things to weigh less. But at the equator, um, there is a lower air pressure in general because it gets more sunlight than any rest in the world between the two tropics, but at the equator in particular, as an average. So because it has a lower air pressure, unless convection will help things with the up, the up moving air, uh, warmer air, will help things to weigh less and give them more buoyant. If you, I'm just going to use the word buoyant because it's colloquial. Uh, but other than that, low air pressure will make things heavier. Right. So it does what, seem to work out to on land. That? But as soon as you enter the ocean, that conception, that idea that it's because of some centripetal force immediately breaks because no, 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 yeah, no, things no, actually sink no, deeper in the ocean. No, no, the whole convention breaks down because what the convention does in Brian's description, ball or otherwise, is describe the downward vector of something that's more dense than the air it's placed in on a man-made device. That's a is, really is, specific thing that's being tr described there. Yeah. It's it right. technology and fundamentally it, that... That Brian's describing there, because he's discussing how the air molecules will affect how the balance reacts to things being put on it. It's affecting how, again, the mechanism is varying its function in a different environment, as he referenced density and buoyancy. So the density and buoyancy, the, the density of the medium, sorry, that that the that the scales are, are are situated in has an effect on its functionality. So Adam, I got a Adam, I got a business plan uh, based on this. You buy gold at the lower altitudes, and then I'm going to open up Mount Everest Gold Exchange (LTD), where you could sell it and make more money. I'm afraid uh, that's what that I the, just said. I, hold on, hold on. I'm afraid that the logistics yeah. side effect of that would make it a non-viable operation financially. Uh, it's already been debunked. It's already been debunked by Archimedes' principle. You can verify the quote unquote mass of the gold by volume displacement. Yeah, but the problem is with the point that Adam cool. was making. Hold on. The problem that he was saying is that if you're in a different buoyancy rate medium, like for example, if you weigh yourself in water, you're going to weigh different. So if you weigh yourself in different buoyant atmospheres or atmosphere planes or whatever you want to call them, you're going to weigh different. Go on, sleep more. The problem with Archimedes' principle is that because it's calculating the weight, and weight relies on gravity being a force, we know that gravity is no longer a force. Einstein invalidated Archimedes' principle, unfortunately. No, Archimedes' principle came before any gravity. Archimedes' principle is a lot older. They just hijacked it, Anthony. That's all they did. I know it came they before. I know it came before. But when, when Einstein removed gravity being a force, when you look at Archimedes' principle, talks about the weight of a volume of water that was displaced well that weight is it requires gravity to be a force and we know that that's no longer a force so only in their paradigm basically invalidated yeah. that maths only oh, in their paradigm that's false yeah, yeah, no, yeah not in not in physical reality but in their paradigm he's correct once you in change paradigm, the, yeah. the yeah. format yeah. of yeah. einstein's gravity to a Absolutely. bending of space time their their archimedes principle doesn't make sense anymore with their type of gravity that they would insert in their paradigm but that's a bit of a mouthful but i can read between the lines of what anthony's saying i have an archimedes one ounce gold coin being printed right now in my mind i'll meet you on everest cool. i've got 10 bucks <laughs> question i'll yeah, let you have a a, i'll let the, you have a peek the principle at the principle still remains the principle of buoyancy and density still remains that if you get on a scale and it says 100 pounds and you put those same two objects underwater, that scale will read a different reading. 
Yeah, but that's because water weight is a different convention. Don't violate a pun. But the difference is, like, regardless water weight is a different convention. Yeah, but, it's not the same weight. It's not the what, same differential. But weight, what is weight? Weight is a singular downward vector. So if something no, doesn't have the same... No, not necessarily. It's, 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 it's a downward vector. Brian's following off from this. Sleeping Warrior. Let him go. Go ahead, Brian. Thank you, uh, Nathan. Weight is something to... For something to have what they call weight, it has to have a singular downward vector. That's why gas without being in a container, can't be weighed because it doesn't have a singular downward vector. So air has no weight because it doesn't have a singular downward vector. So it depends on how much downward vector force you can add that for, the, for you to be weighed. Like if you, if you lie in mercury, you're not going to have much weight, are you? You know what I mean? Because the amount of support you have on it is so dense. It's like being in quicksand. Sounds like a YouTuber challenge. So Sounds like wait, a structural it, support to me. Yeah, don't don't, don't go mercury. mercury. It's poisonous. Oh, no. Don't do that. That's why oh, I said it's the gas is poisonous. poisonous. I've just looked it up question. anyway, 10th, and your prices are way too steep. Hold on, I have a question. Did he just say Very that? Very nice. A gas and they're climbing all the time. I'm sorry, citation police. We we're, we're planning. It's, it's our bad. I'm really sorry. Go ahead. Did he just say that gas in a container doesn't have weight? I, I misunderstood. No, I think. Wait, no that's no, not what I is... said. No, I, hang on. I, I, give me. I, I don't. I, I can speak for myself. No, I said you must put gas into a container to weigh it. Oh, okay. Because okay. how do you get yeah, it to I exert was... its pressure on a set of scales without having a container yeah. to do it, right? Yeah, well, gotcha. you can't I even weigh it unless you compress it. Hang on, he's trying to say something back to me. All right, now that we've established that, can we get back what to the What did the lad say proper? back and what you said? Okay. If you put gas in a container and weigh it, right, in a certain medium where the scale that it's on and the container, right, are in a certain buoyant environment, okay, and then you take it to a different buoyant environment with a different buoyancy value, the scale will no longer have as much mechanical pressure on it and it will give you a different reading. So this is just an example of buoyancy and density in that play. Yep, good summary. It's well, just to medium just change. to add on that, we don't we don't don't weigh gases because you can't weigh gases. Whenever we're measuring, quantifying, yes. buying, selling gases, are, are described not in grams; they're described in volume and pressure. So I've got a five liter container at thirty thousand bar, whatever. Yeah, that defines the amount of substance you've got when we're talking about gases. And we don't weigh them because it's by their nature. The gases, they're exerting forces in all directions. There is, as Brian relates, no direct downward pressure from them, um, which is what solids and liquids do. So when we, say when we quantify gas, it's done in terms of both its pressure and its volume to get the amount. But with that, I'm going to say a huge, massive, enormous thank you to both Discord and G Plus panels for making today's after show possible. And of course, a massive thank you to all of you in either Nathan Oakley 1980 or Nathan Oakley Primering streams for hopefully smashing the super chat, liking, commenting, sharing, subscribing, hitting the PayPal link and all that good stuff. I've been Nathan Oakley and I will see you all in the next video. <laughs>